like say I'm losing 300k against someone I'm not happy at all about it but it's more like I'm really unhappy about the result because it indicates I'm worse than my opponent or maybe because I just feel unlucky for myself but it's not about it's not about the money it's more like the score against a certain opponent I feel like it's not that hard to to numb down at these stakes because like you're losing 500k in a day like what should I be thinking about should I thinking like okay I could have bought uh, I don't know few sport cars or something like it, it doesn't make any sense to to think about that as real money I feel like Hi, it's Ranchix. Welcome to my podcast. Today, my guest is one of the most successful online poker players who many of you might recognize as Raul Gonzalez on Poker Stars or San Iker on Full Tilt Poker. In his 13-year-long career, he quickly rose through the ranks in No Limit Hold'em Ring and Heads Up Games, transitioned to draw games and eventually to mixed games. He battled against all of the toughest nosebleed players along the way. Most notable are his multi-year battles against Isildur and very sweet. Now he decided to retire from poker and he doesn't hold anything back in this conversation. He shares a lot of useful tips and we get to talk about some of his most memorable matches. As always the timestamps are in the description so feel free to jump around the topics and leave a comment. Let me know what are your key takeaways from this episode and of course any additional questions you'd like to ask. Also please subscribe, spread the word, hit the like button and if you haven't already subscribe to my newsletter in it i share my summary of key takeaways from each new episode signing up is very easy just go to runchuckspodcast.com the rest is straightforward and now enjoy this conversation with folke aka raul gonzalez so yeah folke uh awesome it's great to have you on the show i wanted to do this for a long time and now it's a perfect time because uh you're quitting yeah that's true Thanks for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure. And uh, for a lot of people, very unexpected. Uh, I mean, for, for the people who know about you, and in general, I guess, people who know about you, you don't require any introduction. You're just a legend. Um, so let's first address the people who might not know you. Uh, so maybe give us sure. a quick intro about who you are. Uh, sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm a 32-year-old uh, poker player from Germany. I've been playing poker pretty much since finishing school, so like in 2007, or like more seriously from more from like 2009, 2010. Mm. I started off. So basically, I pretty much just played online. I've not played in any live games. Basically, um, I started off as a no limit hold'em player transitioning into a heads up pretty early on. And I think in 2014, for the first time, I uh, started playing a different game, Deuce to Seven Triple Draw, which kind of became my main game, I guess, or the game I was best known for. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I guess like most people, I think from draw games, I transitioned into mixed games later on between 2015 or 16. And yeah, I've basically been playing high stakes to nose plates uh, in those formats since then. Well, I don't even know where to start because I feel like we're going to cover so much ground in this conversation. Um, let's start with the obvious, the big news, you're quitting. Why? <laughs> uh I mean, it's kind of difficult question, but um, basically for the last like one and a half years or so, I've just been playing against Barry Sweet on PokerStars in uh, various formats, but let's say it was always some kind of like eight game or horse or some kind of mix. Mm. The main reason for that was because one, he was available and wants to play. And uh, second reason was that there was pretty much nobody else wanting to play me except for like Sauce, who I would not like to play. So I was kind of left without any choice but playing him or not playing at all. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I've been losing to him. Uh, and at this point, I just don't feel like I want to keep playing against him anymore. Uh, 
And I mean, I could I could just step down and stake some or also go to some other poker sites. But I feel like these stakes are kind of kind of low compared to, to what I've been playing before. And also, like, it just doesn't feel like I can really win anything significant on these stakes, uh, like both money wise and emotionally speaking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I felt like it's it's time to to. Uh, to step back from these games and just quit altogether. I mean, I, I have to say, like, if for example some big mixed game would come up in the next uh, couple of months on Broker Stars uh, was like a really good spot, I would not mind playing again. So it's not like quitting and and, and coming not coming back under any circumstances. But uh, yeah, I mean, such a game hasn't happened in the last couple of years, and I don't think it's going to happen in the next few years. So. Mm. I'm pretty sure this is a quitting without coming back. Right. And what stakes are we talking about for those who don't know? <clears throat> so uh, the game I was playing against Paris Sweet was always uh, 1K, 2K, which is the highest uh, limit stakes that uh, PokerStars has. Um, like if you talk about 1K, 2K, 8 game, it's 250, 500 PLO and no limit with a 40 big blind cap. But um, like in the last couple of months, we've just been playing horse, so there was no big bet uh, format in that. Mm -hmm. mm. And then there has been some crossbook on these games. So, like, let's say it's been over two k, four k on average. But yeah. Uh. All right. So I'm curious. You said Source is willing to play. You're not willing to play Source, but you're willing to play very sweet. Uh, do you want to tell me more about it? <laughs> uh, I mean, very sweet until like two years ago or more like one and a half years ago, he was just playing PLO. And I mean, it's no secret that he's very, very good at PLO, maybe the best, maybe one of the two or three best. Um, but uh, he was kind of inexperienced at mixed games. And when he started out playing mixed games, a lot of the stuff he did was looking kind of weird or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Sauce, like Sauce, He's also very, very good at PLO. He's also very, very good at No Limit Hold'em. Uh, but he's been playing mixed games for a couple of years now. In fact, for a few, meal, few years more than I did. Um, and he's just very, very good overall. I think in eight game, uh, he's arguably the best player, I would say. Mm -hmm. At least in heads up. Right. So how does these how do these games look like? Because obviously you guys prearrange, um, you know, to play yeah. um, a specific amount of hands or a specific uh, amount of time. So how does this usually work? Yeah, uh, so I think the main difference to like lower stakes is at lower stakes you just join someone and uh, see if he plays, and if he sits out and sits out a couple of times, I guess you kind of recognize that you, you won't play, so you stop joining that person unless it's king of the hill type uh, system. Uh, at the highest stakes, there are few, like very few players in the pool, and it's more like you have these players in some kind of like Telegram, for example, or WhatsApp, and uh, you just talk to them and say, hey, uh, are you interested in playing? And um, usually they, they don't want to play the format you want to play. Like, say, I want to play horse and someone else is, want, is uh, wanting to play eight game. And then you come to an arrangement like saying, okay, we play horse, but we also play another game that you like. Or we play eight game, but another format that, uh, another game that I like. So, yeah, usually there's a compromise and then you start playing. Um, yeah, mm. see from there. How does this compare, let's say, to some of the challenges that we have nowadays? Like, for example, the Galfon challenge, where they have the set amount of hands, they agree to play every day with specific breaks. Do you go with like uh, such structure, or mm. it's a bit more free usually? Uh, it's a lot more free. Uh, it was very sweet. Uh, I think that's been the most structured way I've ever played because we've kind of agreed to play Monday to Friday and usually played between like I don't know. 11 and 11 and three, so like uh, four hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no obligation. So if you had no time or no interest in playing for a week, you could just say that. 
And uh, I think that's the only uh, difference to the like Galphon challenge where you just have to play a certain amount of hands or otherwise you're going to uh, pay a penalty fee. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, okay. obviously, like, uh, still, you're playing most of the time. So it's a big difference to these random matches happening uh, on, on Poker Stars because you arrange to, to be there at, let's say, 11 a.m. and you just start playing. Mm -hmm. And how does the preparation for these matches look like? Because obviously, once you're negotiating that you guys are going to be playing, you already are planning, okay, it's going to be a longer match. We're going to play possibly for a month, possibly more. Yeah. Um, and you know it in advance. How's the yeah. prep for it? Um, so, I mean, for example, this year when we were just playing horse and deuce to seven, that basically meant for me that I don't have to work on my No Limit Hold'em and PLO game. And I was just focusing on these six games that we were playing. And uh, I mean, since I've been since I've been playing last year already against Barry Sweet, I could just uh, go through the hands and look at the stats that Barry and I have been playing last year. Um, I think if if it was just against a fresh new opponent, uh, the only yeah. You just you will just focus on the games that you're playing and just ignore all the other games because obviously if you play uh, someone for four months and not playing against anyone else pretty much there's no there's no uh, there's no reason to practice no limit holding for example mm -hmm. in that time yeah well let's take a step back and uh, talk about how you got to this point because obviously the games that you're playing online that's the highest the absolute there's nothing higher. Uh, yeah, running online, so it's basically the pinnacle, and it definitely yeah. is the pinnacle because it is the mixed games. It's you know, it's just yeah. I mean, as as good as good, good as it gets. Um, yeah. What was your journey um, to this point? Um, from mixed games or from the, like the beginning. <laughs> Well, I guess from the beginning, because, you know, there's going to be probably an interesting period in your life where all of a sudden, you know, as, as we all do when we reach the high stakes, for the yeah. most part, it's just a surprise. Yeah. You're just grinding, 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 and all of a sudden you realize, oh, uh, somehow I'm here. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, in, in school, basically, at some points, a few of my friends started playing, like hosting a, a small poker game or like um, playing poker instead of doing the stuff we would otherwise do. And I remember like initially I was not happy about that at all because I didn't like to play poker much. Um, and uh, two or three guys there uh, knew about the poker site, pokerstrategy.com, uh, where you would get... Uh, I don't remember the details actually, but I think you would get $10 for free. And then if you rake a certain amount, you would get another $50 back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I was playing a computer game at that time at like somewhat high level, but not super high level, Warcraft 3, uh, I was kind of interested in like another challenge like Warcraft because I was kind of transitioning out of that at that time. Um, so yeah, I, I gave online poker a try. Uh, although I didn't like poker much at that point. And um, I guess it was similar to me as for most people. Uh, when, I, when I started uh, playing these online games, uh, I also started railing a little bit at the higher stakes and looked at what kind of uh, amount of money they were playing for. Uh, and I kind of felt like that level system where you would rise from the lower stakes and you mm. could eventually come to the very top. But I was not thinking that it's a real possibility for me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I just I just started grinding up and tried to to become as good as I can. Mm. I would say I was not I was not particularly quick in uh, rising up in stakes at the beginning uh, because I was not that interested in the game itself, and uh, I don't know, like. I think in the first few months where you play poker, it's not that great of a game. It's more like learning stuff and not uh, not being creative about stuff or uh, modeling uh, things because that comes much later. 
but eventually I, I got to mid stakes and when I got to mid stakes, um, I was talking to a friend of mine and learned that he was already playing high stakes. Uh, I knew him just from Warcraft and he started coaching me in No Limit Hold'em back then. And that's definitely where I started uh, rising through stakes much, much quicker because you have someone to look up to, you have someone to ask questions and you see what is possible if you work hard enough and uh, play good enough, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that, that was definitely a turning point for me. Um, and yeah, from there on, I mean, obviously there were downswings, but uh, I would not say that at some point something extraordinary happened for me. You mentioned several times that you didn't like poker when you first encountered it. And even when you first started playing it, you didn't really enjoy it. Um, yeah. What specifically, like, wh why do you say you didn't like it much? Like, what uh, what was the feeling? Like, uh, I mean, my, my first impression was that pretty much you, like, you learn starting hand shots, you play super tight. And like, I mean, the first poker book I bought at that time was Harrington on Hold'em or Harrington mm -hmm. on Tournaments. I don't know. Right. What the, yeah. And <laughs> if you ever like play that strategy in a home game, what happens is kind of you play like five hands uh, for the entire evening. That just feels super boring. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, when you just start playing and someone tells you, okay, this hand is an open raise, this hand is a fold, you just got to accept it. Like it's not, like as a beginner, you don't have any way to challenge uh, those, uh, those, those decisions. Like you cannot, you cannot try to come up with, with your own logic pretty much, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was very different from the game I was used to playing because there you could just like, you just have to work on your own. There was no learning material. You just had to work on your own and uh, get as good as you can be. And I like that that much more. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what appeals to you in poker? Because obviously at some point something changed and you, and yeah. you started to love the game. Um, what was the biggest difference? Um, I think... Switching to heads up was a very very big step because at heads up it, the idea becomes much more real that you just have to be better than your opponent. Uh, no matter how you do it, you just have to be better. Like uh, in six max, it felt much more like learning things, and in, in heads up, it felt more like uh, you're playing one opponent. You have to figure out how he's playing. You have to figure out what he's doing wrong, and you have to figure out what you're uh, doing wrong yourself and what you might be exploiting. And uh, then you you have stuff like uh, like back then when I started playing heads up everyone was like most people were really really bad so you had stuff like okay he's just defending too tight or folding too much to three bets I should just start raising a lot very with very small sizing and stuff like that and you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of stuff to think about and mm -hmm. um, you could model things like what should I be doing against someone who's Folding a lot to see bet on a certain board, but he's also raising a lot. Should I be betting small? Should I be betting big? Should I be betting with a very wide range or a very small range? Stuff like that. That was all very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So creating the game plans and then see them, seeing them work, probably very yeah. rewarding. Yeah, for sure. Right. In general, like. I'm quite interested in your opinion, actually, about the preparation and studies. Because from all the people that I know playing poker, you have just the best work ethic, in my opinion. Okay. You know, in, in the <laughs> way the way you approach the studies, the way you dive into it and take it so seriously. Um, is it specifically for, like, because of the heads up and because of 
finding the motivation to prepare for specific matches or do you feel like if it was just playing randoms all the time you would still have the same same um put the same effort mm. in mm. i mean when i started playing high stakes uh no limit heads up i was pretty much just playing randoms because it was mostly on the euro sides and it was looking like at the beginning of, you of the day you open up a lot of tables on different sites mm -hmm. and then people just will join you leave you and uh yeah it was going on like that for years uh i would say i i didn't i didn't have a as good of a as a work ethic as i do now back then but um I mean, still, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Like, you can make notes on your opponents. You can work on your general game plan. But it was not, you're not working as much on a specific game plan against a specific opponent, like now against Very Sweet, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I would say it definitely helps that you're playing heads up and also helps that you're playing against one single opponent. If you just play against one single opponent, uh, it also gets like, I wouldn't say it gets personal, but you really want to beat that opponent. So uh, I think it's kind of easy to motivate yourself working really hard on your game. Mm -hmm. And obviously you've seen a lot of other people working on their game and you've probably seen a lot of things that they do wrong. Do you want to yeah. talk about it? Like what is in Europe? Because I know that you're very... You think a lot about how to make your studies, your work more efficient. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, the most obvious way you can uh, study in a bad way in poker is not study enough, <laughs> like volume wise. Uh, like, I feel like a, a lot of people, especially at lower high stakes or even lower stakes, they play a lot because obviously they're earning nice money and they want to earn, uh, they want to keep earning that. Uh, but I think that way you don't really get to the very top unless uh, you don't do anything else. Like you play 10 hours a day and study six hours a day. That's obviously possible. But I think if you just play like eight hours a day and then don't spend any more time on poker, you will never get to the very top. Ever. Mm. Well, actually, um, that's interesting. Yeah. So you are at the very top. How much do you study? Um, I mean, before I was playing very sweet, so when I was playing more uh, different opponents, I was studying much, much less because I just had more time playing. Uh, mm -hmm. At a certain level, you just have to take the action that you get, and you can't uh, like you, you can't deny the action because when it comes, you have you have to take it, and you don't have the chance to play any other games. So, especially when Isildur was still playing, you just had to play when Isildur want, wanted to play, uh, and I was studying much less at that time. Um, against Barry Sweet, there were a lot of more like off times and also we were just playing four hours a day or so usually so you had a lot of time left um i think this year has been most extreme for me uh i would say maybe six seven hours a day maybe a bit more studying yeah i guess i guess it was actually more but it was like six or seven hours of intense studying uh yeah, pretty pretty sure a lot of people are are shocked by those numbers because <laughs> you know, as uh, I coach some people and obviously I talk a lot with other people and uh, you know some guys are just super proud about studying like thirty minutes a day every day. It's for them it's like amazing, but obviously these numbers are crazy. But anyway, I sort of interrupted you there. You you started talking about uh, the mistakes that other people make uh, in their studies yeah. and their approach. And obviously, so the first thing is just not studying enough. Um, yeah. What else comes to mind? Uh, I feel like, I mean, obviously the other way would be to not study efficiently. And I feel like uh, a lot of people, for example, are working uh, 
a lot on like finding out the exact sizing, exact optimal sizing for a, a certain spot, uh, or like figuring out like what your check raising range should look like on a super rare a cane board, like I don't know, uh, a trip sport, for example. Um, I feel like that is not as relevant. I mean, obviously, there is. It's interesting to find out about the sizing because then you can also apply the logic you learned about the sizing on other boards. But in general, I feel like you you should look at the spots that are uh, most relevant and not like the most interesting ones at first. Like, sure, mm-hmm. it might be interesting like what you should be check raising on ace, 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 but that board will just happen maybe two or three times in your poker career. So it's not as, as, as relevant. Um, I think generally speaking, uh, you should look at the stuff that's where you where you struggle pl- when playing. Like you have to be really uh, perceptive when playing where you struggle at, and then look at these things. Even though they might not be as fun because you're not good at it, and uh, nobody wants to hear that. Like he has big leaks in his poker game, mm-hmm. uh, and it's more fun to look at like very fancy stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, the two main things, like not studying enough and not studying efficiently in the sense of not looking at the most relevant things. Mm. Yeah, not looking at the most relevant things and also just going too deep into specifics, even if they are relevant. But you know, if you're going to study six to seven hours a day, I would assume you can go deep into specifics and it's fine. But if you're only studying like, let's say an hour a day or something, then just yeah. going super deep into one spot, it's just not efficient enough and you're you're too slow. And I mean, if, if you want to do it, you should at least try to like cross check different boards, for example, and like different spots and see if you are, if what you learned applies to other spots as well. Uh, and not like just isolate one spot, look at it, and try to get as good as possible at it, but ignore all the all the other right. spots. Um, as a mixed game player, obviously there's so much to study, so many different games. Yeah. Um, how do you structure your study plan? Do you do you batch the same game? Uh, so do you focus on one game, or you sort of? Um, try to spread it out between different games. How's, how's your approach there? Um, for the last like one or two years, basically my approach has been to always have like one game for a week that I would really focus on because I felt like it's my worst game. And then like, it's kind of hard to, when you, when you play mixed games to, to study just one game, six hours, seven hours a day or even more. Uh, usually, when I when I feel like I get bored and not or like not can't focus anymore, I would switch to a different game uh, or take a break for some time. Um, I would uh, just go out for the next game that I like that I want to study or that I feel like I'm not as good at, um, and I would basically not study at all at the one or two games that I felt were my strongest games and. Mm-hmm. Uh, why I would have not learned as much by studying anymore. Right. And I suppose, at least from my experience, and I, I mean, I have extremely limited experience in mixed games compared to yours, but I always found that whenever I play mixed games, playing or thinking about other games teaches me something about all the other games because some of the concepts overlap and obviously just the decision-making process overlaps. Uh, did you feel the same way? Uh, do you do you feel the same way now when uh, when you study different games? Yeah, I definitely feel the same way now. Uh, a few years ago, I wouldn't have felt uh, that way because I, I think that the better you get, the more you see how concepts are overlapping and uh, how similar the games are in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that that's definitely true. You when you study RAS, for example, you come like. You see something at the river that you don't understand at first, and then you dig deeper and understand it, and then uh, think like, oh, I had a stud high hand recently where uh, something happened as well that I didn't understand back then, and mm-hmm. now you can cross-apply it and it makes sense all of a sudden. 
and not just between the start games, also it's like uh, some stuff that's applying at RAS also applies at limit hold'em and, and so on. So uh, yeah, for sure, you definitely mm. learn a lot about uh, the other games. Right. And I think what you're saying also exemplifies um, the study process as it is, because in poker, when we're studying, it's all conceptual. So it's much easier to connect to existing concepts. So sometimes you might see the answer right in front of your eyes, but you can't understand the answer because you're not ready yet. You're you're missing some other puzzle pieces and then eventually yeah. things fall into place and it's a, always a beautiful feeling. Yeah. Um, oh man, so many things I want to go to. <laughs> Let's stick with the studies uh, for now because I wonder what was your biggest... Uh, what was the feeling when you started going into the mixed games? Um, I mean, the reason why I started going to the mixed games was actually kind of weird because uh, at that time, John Robert Belongs wanted to uh, play against me, but so far we had always played Badugi and Deuce to Seven, and he felt like Badugi and Deuce to Seven are not really like fair between the two of us. And he had a lot of experience at mixed games, so he wanted to play, uh, started playing eight game with me instead of the draw games. Mm -hmm. um, and he told me that like three or four days before, before he actually arrived in Europe and we would start playing. And I had never played a single hand of Brass or Stutz or Omar High Low in my, in my life. Um, so yeah, back then I was talking to Alex on Moon, uh, who was a very good eight game player. And I asked him if he if he is okay to coach me uh, at these games, and he was. Uh, and w we started at very very low level. Like I was asking him questions that would probably look ridiculous uh, by now uh, mm -hmm. about the about the games. Um, it felt definitely kind of overwhelming because when you're just playing no limit and then play just seven for a while. Uh, especially the start games feel super weird because uh, the position is changing uh, all the time in, uh, during the hand and uh, playing playing Omaha lore or just Omaha in general felt pretty weird with four card, as a four card game when you were just used to two cards before. Um, yeah, it definitely felt overwhelming. That was my main impression of, of eight game. Mm -hmm. But it also felt super fun because uh, I was playing No Limit Hold'em at quite a high level back then, I guess. Now, by, by nowadays standards, it was not so good. Uh, and I was playing Deuce to Seven at very high level. Uh, and when you play the eight game, it was, it was more like a feeling someone challenged me to play some random board games for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I would just have to get as good as possible at these board games that I usually would play with friends for no money at all. And you would make ridiculous mistakes, but not really care about it. And uh, so it was overwhelming, but also super fun because, uh, yeah, it was a different type of playing poker. It was not uh, like, okay, I have to figure out the exact sizing or I like can use seven, the exact blocker. You were thinking about very, very fundamental things like not playing a super bad hand preflop, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really fun for me. Like when I started playing mixed game, I had not experienced as much fun in poker for a few years already. Mm. Why did you accept the challenge in the first place? Um, well, because I was winning quite a lot against him in Deuce of Seven and Badugi, and I felt like it would be bad sport to deny it. And also I felt right. like he would keep giving me action in eight game. Even if I start out as a losing player against him, he would probably play me in the future. And I had hopes to get at least as good uh, to, to beat him uh, in eight game. Like I, I wasn't... I wasn't confident I would be beating like eight game regulars at some point, but uh, was confident enough I could beat him uh, over like a few months at least. Mm -hmm. All right. Speaking of those challenges, what were some of the most memorable matches that you played? Uh, I think the most memorable one would be against Isildur, just because we played so many hands like i feel like i played over half of my hands at high stake against isildur mm -hmm. uh i mean maybe that's not true but it, it definitely feels like that because we've been playing 
from 2012, where we played the first time, until 2018. And like at first, we were just playing No Limit Hold'em for a few years. Then we were playing uh, Fuse to Seven. We were playing PLO. And then it, eventually, we were playing Ape Game. Uh, it felt like he was like uh, like my main opponent through pretty much all my poker career. And uh, specifically in, in 2017, in the summer, we were playing a shitload of hands. Like uh, pretty much, I just like from that summer, I just remember that I was playing against him every day. Uh, I was not doing anything else, basically. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would say very sweet, obviously, because he was the last opponent I played. He was also the opponent that I lost lost the most to by very, very far. Um, I don't know. Like otherwise, uh, I would guess Will Hasha and No Limit Hold'em back then. Mm -hmm. But it's so long ago. Like my mem memories are much more fresh for the games against Isildur and and Very Sweet. Uh, and I mean, obviously, there were other opponents too that were really fun to play against, or where I won a lot or lost a lot. But yeah, these these two opponents stick out for sure. What do you think in general about this soldier? Because obviously, his story uh, has been pretty public. He's got a lot of uh, fans. Yeah. Um, quite an interesting style. Quite a meteoric rise and pretty reckless. Uh, yeah. very entertaining to watch anyway but uh, like how how do you feel it looking from outside because obviously for you personally uh, I mean obviously you played the guy six years so yeah. <laughs> it's it's it tells tells us something but like looking from outside like what, what do you think about his story um, I mean it's definitely kind of impressive because when you look at high stakes DB and see how many hands he played at high stakes and then like check a few other profiles where you um, suspect they would have played a lot at high stakes. Like he he played, it feels like he played like ten times more than anyone else at the high stakes. So he's definitely been like uh, like if someone would write a book about high stakes uh, online high stakes, uh, like the main chapter would have to be about is that there's no way around it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the main difference between him and the other players is that uh, like. Like he was not a fish, so it's not like he, he was someone like Gus Hansen, for example. Uh, like compared to, like, I mean, Gus Hansen is a good poker player, but he lost a lot of money on on high stakes, and he, the games were running around him. Obviously, mm -hmm. he's like I'm not sure about his overall results, but uh, looking at how many hands he played, he was not like a big losing player, so he was very competitive. Um, but he was. Working or yeah, working or thinking about the game completely different from all his opponents because pretty much all his opponents uh, were working super hard on their games. They're working with solvers. They're working. Were thinking very theoretically about the game. Whereas Isildur, like, I'm pretty sure he basically never spent a second of his life like working on his game. Like he would maybe discuss one specific hand with with a friend, or maybe even talk about something with a friend briefly, but he would never study on a day. Uh, so he was just playing all the time and going from there, like trying to improve by improving his intuition. Uh, and that's really impressive, like uh, staying at somewhat top level with that approach when everyone else is much more professional or has a very different approach. Mm. And I think like from my uh, from my perspective, the craziest thing about him was like he was completely reckless about the stakes he wanted to play. So, uh, like the first reason was he kind of had no bankroll management. So if he if he had like hundred k online to play with, he would already play uh, 400, 800, or one k, two k even. And if he had like a million, he had no issues at all increasing like making a cross book. Uh, so the stakes would kick up to I don't know, four k, eight k or something. Like he had no, like he had no ending point pretty much. Like he would just keep increasing the stakes, which was really insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I mean, how how do you deal with the swings actually? Because even without the, all the cross books, just the stakes on paper, that's already like the swings are going to be so huge. Uh, 
did you numb down over the years or do you still feel um, emotional about it occasionally? I guess I numbed down a lot uh, over the years. Um, I mean, the the stakes, the stakes don't like, they don't matter that much to me. Uh, like say I'm losing 300K against someone, I'm not happy at all about it, but it's more like I'm really unhappy about the result because it indicates I'm worse than my opponent or maybe because I just feel unlucky for myself. Mm-hmm. But it's not about it's not about the money. It's more like the score against a certain opponent. Uh, because I feel like I feel like it's not that hard to to numb down at these stakes because when you're playing lower stakes, like let's say uh, 400 NL or PLO, um, so your buy-in is $400 for a table. Um, like these amounts like still exist in your everyday life pre- to some extent at least. Mm-hmm. But when you're playing for like, like you're losing 500K in a day, like what should I be thinking about? Should I thinking like, okay, I could have bought, uh, I don't know, a few sport cars or something. Like it, it doesn't make any sense to to think about that as real money, I feel like. Mm. Um, I mean, maybe that approach does work for me and for other people. It's still like they are losing uh, sport cars every day or winning sport cars every day. But for me, like I, I, at some point, I just stopped thinking about uh, about, the, about the money. Because hmm. I, I remember reading through your AMA thread, which is uh, actually super awesome. And I'm going to leave the links in the description to your 2 plus 2 uh, thread. Because obviously the original was in German, but in two plus two there there are some yeah. tr- translations out there. Uh, but there was one sentence that uh, struck me as very interesting. It was something along the lines that until recently you actually believed that you would lose most of your money back, and you were absolutely fine with that. Is that accurate, or is that some uh, mis- no, mistranslation? That, that, that was a mistranslation. Uh, what I'm guessing, uh, what I guess. Where it's coming from is basically, um, I said that, like I was asked how my uh, family and close friends were thinking oh, about- So they were thinking the that, that you would be losing-, losing uh, at, at least at least my my parents uh, did, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you ever feel, like, cause I imagine from one perspective, right? As you said, it makes no sense to think about this money uh, in terms of cars or houses or yachts or whatever, because it is, uh, as you said, it's not an amount that you encounter in the day-to-day life, especially when the swings are daily. Did you ever think about that you're not willing to go beyond some some point? Let's say you would, if you hit the downswing, there is some sort of stop loss. Did you ever yeah. have that feeling? Um, well, actually, for a while, that has been like a meme uh, in our like small uh, high stakes community um, because I was telling at some point in I think 2011 that uh, like no limit 20k would be the absolute maximum I would ever want to play. Like uh, I just felt at that point like no limit 20k. Okay, that's that's okay from a certain perspective, but no limit 40k, for example, would just be too too big, uh, too big money to play for, basically. Mm-hmm. And like a month later, when I had kind of had kind of been successful on a no limit 20k, I was already playing no limit 40k, <laughs> and like uh, I was just like going through the stakes from there, and like uh, people were. St- always reminding me when I was like playing No Limit 80K, for example, which was the highest I was playing in a big paid game and was the highest possible in online poker. Uh, they kept telling me, yeah, I still remember when you said No Limit 20K is the absolute maximum you can't play higher. <laughs> uh, but like on a serious note, I never f- like, I had a pretty reasonable bankroll management. I feel like I never played for stakes where I felt like, okay, if I run that for a week, that's gonna um, that's gonna hit me financially. Um, and so, no, I, I never really thought about uh, about like giving up after losing a certain amount or not playing certain stakes uh, because like the losses would be too big or something. No. Mm-hmm. 
And that rise, so basically within a month, you went from, I'll, I won't ever play higher than NL, uh, 20K, and you're yeah. all of a sudden, within a month, you're playing higher. That must have been a meteoric rise. How, how did it feel, actually? Because it must be... You're yeah. still the same guy. You're still the same person. You don't feel like you improved four times, that you're all of a sudden a four times better player, yet you're playing way higher than you ever thought you are going to be playing. Yeah. I mean, that was probably like... I mean, it's kind of weird to say that was the peak of my poker career because it's so long ago. But uh, that was definitely like probably the best time I had in poker because from no limit 5k uh, onwards, I started like I started running really good. I think I started working much harder on my game as well. Uh, and like in like in the late few months of 2011 and early month of 2012, I was just rising from no limit 5k basically to no limit 40k or so which was the highest stakes that were possible to play on Euro sites back then. And I was kind of focused on Euro sites back then. Um, yeah, definitely felt very, very good because uh, it was not so long ago where I was just railing these games at No Limit 40k and I mm -hmm. was playing them. Um, but I wouldn't say like, I mean, obviously, I think everyone changes over time, but I, I wouldn't say like I'm a different person, especially not in, in regards to that. Uh, uh, in, in hindsight, I would just say it was a silly idea somewhat to say I never, I will never play no limit above no limit 20k because, I mean, if you ask like a normal person, uh, like no limit 20k where you like sometimes lose or win 20k uh, dollars in one hand, that is completely sick as well. Like uh, I think I don't feel like there is a there's a big difference between risking 20k or 100k or 200k uh at 20k you are already well above the point where uh, like most normal people can refer to the money you're playing for mm -hmm. uh, i think yeah i think most people would already say that playing from like 500 dollars or 1k at a table is like extremely high and shouldn't be done like uh mm -hmm. i think when you go to a 20k it doesn't make any sense to say and a 20k is okay but and a 40k isn't. Yeah. Well, some of those people who would say that playing 1k at the table is too high is probably in your government. And because uh, <laughs> did that true. affect actually <laughs> any, any, did that affect your decision of uh, you know, calling it quits, so to say? Um, no, not really. Uh, like when I, when I, um, read about it for the first time or heard about it for the first time from a friend. Uh, I felt like it kind of sucked, but still like if I wanted to keep playing against like Barry Sweet or someone else, I could also do it on other sites or like arrange it in, in home game with Crossbox. Uh, I'm not sure if that's like technically allowed by poker stars, but it's, it's a reality. Um, it kind of sucks that you're not like, like maybe in 2021, uh, you won't be able to play at like 200, 400 or 100, 200, where the like most normal high stakes games take place for limit players. But no, uh, it didn't really affect my decision at all because as I said before, I didn't really have interest in playing these lower high stakes anyways. And if just about the higher high stakes or no splits, you can play you can play that anyways, and there will always be a way to play these games, I feel like. Mm. How did it feel, actually, to read um, that new legislation? Because you obviously live in Germany, you you don't want to move, you never wanted to move, you're, you're paying the taxes, you're being a good citizen, uh, and you're not yeah. the only one, right? There's a big community of German poker players who are actually paying pretty high taxes and are being professional, et cetera, et cetera. And then you sort of get a slap in the yeah. face in a way. Yeah, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in it, but I've what I've read so far, it doesn't make any sense to me because like one thing would be, uh, as far as I know, No Limit or PLO 1K is the highest you, you're going to be allowed to play from Germany. And like 
like for most people in Germany, if they have a problem with gambling addiction, like playing 1K NL or 1K PLO is way too high. Like if you want to care about these people, like it's it's 10 times too high or something. Uh, they can lose a lot of money at these stakes. Mm-hmm. And like stuff like German poker players can't choose their seed anymore in, in ring games uh, in the future. Like if you're a recreational poker player uh, or like even like a gambling addict poker player, you don't care about the seed anyways. So it's just like causing issues for professional poker players from Germany. And I don't see any reason why why you would do that because uh, obviously like the professional poker players in Germany, they decided against moving moving to other countries. They decided to play to pay the taxes in Germany. And as long as they think it's profitable to do so, they should clearly be allowed to, to play poker professionally. Uh, so yeah, I'd, like a lot of things don't make any sense to me at all about these uh, regulations about gambling. Yeah, yeah, it really felt quite unfortunate, and also I suppose quite unexpected because it wasn't a long time in the making. Like there was not a lot of buzz about we're coming up with this new legislation, so you guys better yeah. prepare. It was all of a sudden from one day to another. At, at least as far as I understand, I obviously didn't pay too close of attention to it, but. Yeah, I mean, a friend of mine who was working with Party Poker, he told me in in private about it, uh, that it will happen at some point. But, but that was only like two weeks before uh, before it actually happened. Um, so yeah, and before that, I've never heard about it at all. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of weird. Yeah. Oh, well, quite unfortunate. But like you said, for you personally, it didn't matter all that much, but it's just sad to know that a lot of people are actually affected by it. And uh, yeah, especially sure. sad to know that the people who, as we already said, the people who decided to stay in Germany, that they're actually paying the taxes. Yeah. But what else do you want, right? You're getting your taxes, you're, you're getting everything uh, officially, everything is being done yeah. properly. And then, uh, no, still. Yeah, I mean, if you want to make regulations, like you can aim to help uh, gambling addicted people, but these regulations don't help help them at all. And uh, I mean, yeah, as you said, I don't see any reason at all why you should prevent uh, professional poker players from Germany to play uh, from Germany and not move to other countries. Mm. And um, yeah. I mean, effectively, it won't be possible to play professionally from from Germany anymore in the near future. Uh, so these people will either move to other countries and pay taxes there, or like at least not pay taxes in Germany anymore, or they will have to give up poker uh, and find something else, which sucks for them because apparently they wanted to keep playing poker. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't see I don't see any merit in these uh, regulations, but yeah. Uh, mm. I think that's probably like true for a lot of regulations outside of poker as well. So, yeah. yeah. So speaking of poker as a career, uh, you've played thirteen years. That's a huge chunk of your life, and for any career, really. I mean, yeah. if you do something for thirteen years, that's that's going to always stay a big part of who you are, um, and yeah. how you identify yourself. What are the things that you took away from poker? What are the biggest, um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, but what are the biggest lessons from poker for you personally? That's a tough question. (laughs) Um, I think one thing for sure is that um, like the variance is much, much bigger uh, than you would normally expect. Like, I often feel like when I talk to non-poker players or read in, in newspapers or online, uh, when people try to explain something, they kind of like try to find a narrative that uh, kind of suggests there's no variance at all involved or like no randomness involved at mm-hmm. all. And when you play poker for so long, you... Uh, you just realize to a certain degree how much more things depend on, on, on randomness or variance. Uh, 
And I think that's a very helpful skill because uh, let's say you run a business and you're analyzing what's going wrong, what's going good, what's going right, and you're just looking at the results, you will just miss a lot of information and uh, yeah, make make a few uh, really bad decisions because of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of affects everything in life because there's hardly anything in life where you can say, okay, there's no randomness involved at all. So that's for sure, I think, the main lesson I would say from poker. Uh, there are other lessons, lessons as well. Like um, <clears throat> when I started railing like the, the biggest poker games in 2009 or so, uh, I felt like, okay, these people... They are playing for hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars. They must they must be playing perfectly, kind of, and they must be super super good. And then when you rise through the stakes and like become one of them, you realize okay, some of these people are pretty much just degenerates, or uh, they're they make a lot of mistakes, and you make a lot of mistakes yourself as well. And uh, since I have experienced that and like um, kind of lost that illusion that the people at the top must be super, super good and impossible to beat. And I looked at other things like sports, for example, or even like business. You also see like a lot of these uh, things like people at the top not being nearly as good as you might think uh, normally. Um, and you just see a lot of like crazy things happening in the real world. Uh, I I think it's a very good experience to to rise through like the ranks and become like one of the best, and you kind of see things in a different light from there on. Uh, um, also, like obviously, you kind of learn in most things it's possible to to come to the very top because if you've never done it, like never done the way from uh, from bottom to the very top where should you take the confidence from that you can you can actually make it but mm -hmm. i think once you've done it in one area obviously like i can't become a professional uh, professional football player from now on but uh, i think i would have much more confidence now to rise through the top in some kind of businesses uh, now uh, i don't know how to say what else i learned i feel like i learned a lot in in, in poker for uh for my life, but it's hard to like, like name one specific concept kind of. Um, I think when you think about stocks or stock market in general, I think you take a lot from poker to, to stock market. Like for example, thinking in EV and just like, like a lot of concepts from poker seem to apply to the financial markets in general, I would say. Mm. And also just the general financial literacy, I assume, because like the way you see the value of your time, yeah, or for for the you know most of the successful long term successful poker players whom I know um, have a pretty good idea about the value of their time and they plan their days and uh, yeah. life accordingly, which is very much lacking uh, quite often in in. Uh, people who rose through the ranks in some other careers. Yeah, I, I would say that's that's kind of associated to the concept of EV. Like uh, in poker, you're just trying to maximize your EV in every way. Like you you think about what side should I be playing on? Like um, what kind of games are running there? What's my estimated win rate? How many hands am I getting to play? You're thinking about, should I stake this guy? Like what is his win rate? How much is he playing? Like what kind of cut do I get? Or Vice versa, obviously, should I should I get a staking by someone? Should I uh, or should I just play lower stakes on myself? You're basically trying to maximize your EV all the time, mm -hmm. and I think once you've started to do that, uh, you will just always do it in other businesses as well. Or when you try to think about how to invest your money, you will also think about uh, all these all these factors. While like. Uh, mm, some other rich people, for example, they don't really, they don't really grasp the idea of EV pretty much. They uh, like oftentimes when you talk about someone uh, about about stocks with someone, they say, "Yeah, but you can lose a lot of money with stocks." 
That's mm -hmm. like uh, like you should think about the EV. Obviously, you should also think about uh, what like what range of results am I willing to accept? Like maybe I'm just not willing to accept a 50% loss of my net worth uh, regardless of the EV. But like you should try to, to think about it in a logical way and not just say, yeah, you could lose everything in stocks. That's true. Uh, but like when you leave the building, when you leave your house, you could also, you could also die in, a, in an accident. doesn't mean you're not going uh, out of your house anymore. So you have to try to think about it in a logical way. I think poker helps a lot for that. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. Um, Folke, you've mentioned that you have the confidence because of the journey that you had. You have the confidence that you could achieve the top and reach the top in, in other fields or you could do the achieving the top in poker once again if you had to. Do you feel that anyone can reach the top in poker or is there specific are there specific limitations that would not allow somebody to do that uh yeah i think there are for sure limitations um i, I don't really think like poker is taking or requiring a lot of like natural skills like most of it i feel like is just kind of like hard work and work ethics uh but I feel like basically the conditions under which you reach poker, uh, for example, if someone um, like doesn't have the temperament, like he's a person that will be very, uh, very negatively affected by bad results, for example, then it will be very, very hard to get into poker or get successful in poker. Mm -hmm. uh, like two of my friends uh, during school, they also started playing online poker and I would not say they, they were less talented than I was for playing games or playing card games or thinking about things in, in a logical way. But like, uh, they just did, they just couldn't stand losing pretty much and it never went away. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe they could have tried much, much harder, but it was definitely uh, harder for them than it was for me. So, uh, that is one factor that's limiting you. I think if you're not interested basically in theoretical concept concepts or thinking about uh, games in general in a, in a theoretical way and trying to get good at them, it will also not be possible for you to get good at, at poker because you have to be really competitive and you have to really like games a lot. And uh, yeah. So I think like... At a certain age, you can just have a very, very heavy handicap uh, for getting good at poker. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's the main issues that you could uh, could struggle with when when trying to become a very good poker player. But I feel like, generally speaking, natural skills are very overrated in poker. Uh, so I think m most people. Uh, most people could become very, very good at poker. And obviously everybody's talking about how tough the games are now compar compared to how they used to be, yeah. which is obviously true, but also that's just a function of the tools that are available on the market. Yeah. So in, in essence, not much has changed really. If you put in a ton of hours before, or if you put in a ton of hours right now the path is pretty much still the same obviously it may, might take you a bit longer nowadays but still yeah. possible I, I mean I, I would say it's it's harder than it used to be um, like for example I think Jungleman and Trutella they started playing poker and like one year afterwards they were already playing 2550 or 5100 you know Mm -hmm. uh, and I think such a meteoric rise would not be possible in uh, nowadays environment anymore, just because uh, like there are not as many people at 400 NL or 600 NL or 1K NL that are basically just donating money to you, uh, which obviously helps to rise through the stakes. But um, yeah, I think otherwise it's it's absolutely absolutely true what you said uh it's just a matter of um like the tools that you could work with and theoretically now if you were 
18 or 19 years old and just finished school, theoretically, you could spend endless amounts of time just studying PyoSolver, for example, and just try, like, say, okay, I, I will be studying part-time, but for two years, I will be just focusing on getting as good as possible in, in poker and spend all my time studying in, in PyoSolver. And you would still, like very likely become a super good poker player and become very successful with poker. So it's just a matter of uh, the time you, you put it into it. Uh, mm. I think, for example, Linus, or I don't know if he's pronounced Linus in English, like he kind of did something like that. And he's still super young. I don't know how young exactly, but he's very young. And uh, he pretty much did that and proved that, and now he's considered by most people to be the best no limit hold'em player, or maybe even like the best overall poker player. Uh, so I think it's still very possible. Mm. Yeah, and it also just makes me think about you know all these stories about the people who reach the top really quickly in the good old days, right? When you know just you jump into games with no prior knowledge and all of a sudden a year later you're playing um 5k hold them for example right like for example the uh jungle man and truth order that yeah. you mentioned but the difference is these guys had always had tremendous work ethic and approach uh with process oriented just let's go and let's study let's figure this out whereas the stories of people who just jumped into it meteoric rise and never put in the time well those stories didn't last for 10 years or 13 years or, or 15 years or more right because at some point just the variance gets gets the better of you and, and all the other factors as well yeah yeah i mean like no matter how good you are at poker or like how talented you are at some point you will struggle uh i think that's just how poker works pretty much because you will just keep rising to the stakes where, uh, like, theoretically, you will run like you reach the stakes that you that you're perfectly fit for. But then at some point, you run good from there and go to higher stakes than you should actually, and you will start playing against people who are better than you and lose. Uh, so, or even before, obviously, because of downswings, uh, you will you will have moments where you struggle a lot and. Uh, if the, if then you're not ready to uh, or willing to to spend a lot of time on it, working on your game or discussing it with friends, um, you will just fail at some point. Uh, and if you look at like Jungle Man or Truta, like Jungle Man, for example, I've heard so many stories about him. He just hates to lose pretty much. If he loses to someone, he will just spend all his time basically to get better and beat that guy. And that's obviously like a great mindset to uh, to become very good at something, not just poker. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously there are drawbacks with that mindset for yeah. the rest of the quality of, of your <laughs> life. But uh, sure. if you if your sole goal is to improve, then that's definitely a great yeah. great way to <laughs> approach it. But I wouldn't say it's advisable for general life, but yeah, it's it's yeah. for sure good becoming very good at one one thing. Yeah. I'm curious, when you are at the very high level, it's like, it's not even a question, it's just an observation. You know, when you're, let's say, a mid-stakes or low-stakes player, and then you're losing, to you it's obvious, okay, well, obviously, I'm, well, hopefully it's obvious that, okay, I'm not too good, I'm not good enough, I need to improve. But once you're at the top, to recognize that it's more than variance, that you're actually lacking something, and to be honest with yourself and tell yourself, like, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. Not as good as yeah. I, I think. It's a pretty pretty uh, important skill to have, and it's a pretty difficult thing to do, to be quick at recognizing that uh, you're weak in some areas and to be very self-critical. Um, what's your opinion on that? Like how important it is to be self-critical is there such a thing as being too too much self-critical uh, should you give yourself a break sometimes uh, how to and how to recognize when it truly is just variance and when it's 
just your fault. Yeah. I mean, in general, it's super hard to separate uh, like variance from your mistakes, basically. Uh, if that was easy, it would be like super clear in every case uh, which player has the action in high stakes. Um, I would still say it's kind of easy to, to spot some of your mistakes because uh, that's a difference, for example, uh, to 10 years ago. Um, you have solvers, for example. So you could you could check how would the solver have played my hand. And if it differs from the way you played it, uh, um, then it's kind of obviously obvious that you made a mistake unless you're intentionally deviated from uh, from the solver. So you you mentioned that in the last question, like uh, there are also like things like upsides nowadays to start poker compared to like 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, nobody knew basically. So it was also, you had to figure out yourself or talk to other people and hope that they, uh, that what they say makes sense. Uh, nowadays, you can just check it pretty much in, in the solutions. Um, so that is kind of helpful for recognizing your own mistakes. And it kind of shows in the in the mixed games as well. Like when you play a game which has a solution, it's much easier to see uh, if you made a mistake and also much easier to assess your own skill level. Whereas in the games that have no solution yet, uh, it's much, much more difficult because you just don't know. Uh, if what you did was wrong, if it just didn't work out this time because you were running unlucky, or if it didn't work out because it was actually bad. Uh, yeah. Like sometimes in start games, you get, like, let's say I make a bluff and Barry Sweet makes a hero call that where I would think he should definitely fold his hand, and he's actually right in this specific case. It's hard to say, like, was I bluffing too many hands and he figured it out, or was he just lucky in this instance? Uh, and I would definitely say, like, being self-critical is super important because otherwise at high stakes you will not improve at some point anymore because obviously you could just look down in the lobby and see, think, like, yeah, I'm already at the top. I, I don't need to improve my game. I'm super su su successful at poker. But then you will just lose two people over time. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would also say it is possible to be too self-critical because you will have downswings no matter how good you play. And if during these downswings, you will uh, just think all the time, okay, probably I'm just playing super, super bad. I'm, I'm losing. Uh, you will play without any confidence. And as long as you're not playing as a bot, basically, and you don't, like, you don't know the solution perfectly, uh, like the confidence or like your intuition will matter. And if you're like busy thinking about I'm losing all the time and making mistakes, you will just perform uh, worse than uh, than a person that is confident. Mm -hmm. Like it's a kind of like you you can't be too overconfident, but you should not lack too much confidence. Uh, it's kind of difficult sweet spot to, to have. Uh, right. And about learning from your mistakes and recognizing your mistakes, um, I want to get back to something you've mentioned earlier about people studying in an inefficient way. Um, I feel like that's very often the case also when analyzing your mistakes. It's too easy to uh, focus in on one mistake, one um, mistake that's sort of isolated, which is going to teach you something about what you did wrong in this specific hand. But if you can't extrapolate to yeah. what exactly was wrong with your thinking process, then what was the point of that work? Would yeah, you agree exactly. with that? Yeah, exactly. I completely agree with that. Um, I think a really good way uh, when studying is whenever you you think you, you found a concept uh, in, in a spot, um, you should like try to make up a very like a very different spot, but where your logic sh should still apply to a certain degree. And like, mm -hmm. say your logic says hand A will be a check, hand B will be a small bet, and hand C will be a big bet mostly in, in that spot. And then you should solve that spot, or if you already solved it, look it up and see if it's true. Because 
if it's not true, then in the future you will be able to play uh, one specific hand uh, well on one specific board, which is basically irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't give you any uh, any benefit for other uh, spots. So I think it's yeah. always super important to uh, being able to cross apply uh, concepts. Mm. But also with what you're saying, it's very important to remember that you can't just cross apply without verifying your hypothesis. Because it's yeah. too easy to just look at one spot and say, oh, well, that basically means that in these situations, we just do this. If you don't check it, yeah, uh, it's risky because there's nothing worse than having a strong belief about something that is actually inaccurate because that's eventually going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely true. Like you have to validate it. And ideally you would not just validate it on one other uh, spot, but also on others. Uh, yeah, I think that is pretty much like uh, what I've been doing for the last two or three years uh, for the most part, like uh, playing against the solution, then I would recognize I made a mistake according to the solution. I would think about like, why is this a mistake? Is this just a mistake against solution? Uh, but it will be good against humans and I'm just conditioned to do that because I feel like it's good against other human players. When I come to the conclusion it's a mistake, like a real mistake, I would check, okay, like, what kind of similar hands play this way? Like, is my hand just like a little bit wrong or is it very wrong? And um, all the similar hands play it differently from how I played it. Uh, and then I would like look at the entire range, look at like how my range plays this, this spot and come up with an explanation for uh, why my hand was a mistake and what I could take away from it as a lesson. Mm -hmm. And then I would try to cross apply it on other spots. And I mean, because these games are so big, uh, you can, I mean, you can do that all day long for years uh, and you will never stop learning. Uh, and I guess the more you do it and uh, the better you perform while playing, like performing in these in intuitive decisions, uh, the better you get at poker and the more money you make. I think it's kind of simple as that. Mm -hmm. I suppose also the easier it becomes for you to find the patience um, to study. Because right, I actually, I want to ask you, because I assume something, but maybe I'm completely wrong. If you study six hours, seven hours per day, does it feel like a chore to you? Does it feel like, oh man, no. you got to study or no. you're always looking forward to it? Yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it a lot. Like, mm. uh, to be honest, like, I would say, like, if the lockdown lasts even longer and uh, uh, I have nothing else to do, I could even imagine myself, uh, like, working some more on these games, uh, either just because it's fun for me and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get as good as possible at these games without actually playing them, mm -hmm. or maybe helping or coaching other people in the future for high stakes games. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't feel like uh, I don't really have to motivate myself to uh, to work on these games or think of, like do the poker theory. Uh, I mean, obviously, as for everyone, on some days it's not very enjoyable. But usually on these days, I just didn't work on poker. So if I did mm -hmm. work on poker, I, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And how do these days look like? Like, do you actually plan it ahead? You have a set schedule, or you just uh, go with the, go with it? Uh, for the most part, I just, uh, like when I wake up, I see how I feel about, uh, working on a specific game and, uh, go from there for a few months this year, I had a fixed schedule just because I felt like I, I kind of need it. And I said like, okay, I want to start studying at 12 and I want to study for five hours, then do some break and do some more studying. Um, but usually I just, uh, decided on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about solvers? Um, 
like from the AMA that I did, when people ask me questions about solvers, it often sounds like, um, like if you have a solver or if you run good solutions, that is pretty much all you need. Like uh, people focus a lot on running very precise uh, solutions. And uh, I mean, it's mostly about making the best use of it, like uh, finding your own method, how to, how to work on it a lot. Uh, or even like trying to uh, get extra tools to to analyze. Like I mean, a solver. Like let's say you would have a solution in No Limit Hold'em from flop to river with ten sizings on each street, mm. uh, and you have like one point seven k flops or so. Uh, I mean, it's impossible to to uh, to um, like learn all of it. <laughs> it's it's impossible. So it's obviously like your your uh, challenge as a professional poker player is to get the most out of it, and uh, it's not that different really from the uh, from the pre solver era where uh, you just had to figure out things on your on your own. It was kind of the same. Like you can't figure out any uh, everything, but you have to figure out as much as possible. So. Uh, I think like just having a solution or just having a solver by itself doesn't mean anything really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can also be a trap for some people because they would focus too much thinking that they're making incredible progress, whereas yeah. perhaps it's not uh, not extremely efficient and perhaps they're actually digging in the wrong direction and trying to be too specific, too uh, detailed in their approach not being able yeah. to execute it in game. Yeah, I would I would also say like for the PLO and no limit games with like different uh, bet sizes, uh, you can kind of easily get tricked into finding the exact uh, like optimal size uh, on the board, or uh, having too many sizes. Like if you're not capable of like um, learning the strategy between like six or seven sizes, what will probably happen is that uh, you will be really off in some situations. Like, so let's say you have seven sizes on the flop, uh, but, and you should be like using the biggest size on average, like overall, like with 6% of your range. Uh, and then like some, some hands are using that size 80% of the time, some are using it 100% of the time, and some are using it 10% of the time. You will never be able to learn that exactly. And, if like your intuition causes you to uh, bet too often with your weak hands and too uh, rarely with your strong hands or vice versa, and your opponent figures that out, and I mean it's possible to figure that out just by like looking at your overall game, you will, you will get exploited super hard by them, and in like your perception, you're playing like perfect GTO. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of issues that come with very complex uh, solutions. Right. And I mean, speaking... I'm, I'm not saying, sorry, no, I, I'm ahead. not saying like, um, like you shouldn't look at many bet sizes because when you look at uh, like the highest no limit games nowadays, these people are using a lot of bet sizes that people were not using a few years ago, like very small, or very big ones. And apparently there's a merit in understanding how these bet sizes work. But I think like creating such complex trees should more be designed for uh, for the purpose of like understanding in what kind of situations certain bet sizes make sense. But then when you actually learn the game tree, probably most people would be off better learning a less complex strategy, I would say. Yeah, and speaking of recognizing um your opponent's mistakes, right? Because as you said, if you if you play at the high level and you have this this balance in your range somewhere and you're actually making mistakes, your opponents are likely to um, spot those mistakes. And obviously, the, the biggest difference, or at least in my opinion, the biggest difference between the high stakes and the mid stakes is that people, your opponents are better at recognizing and exploiting your mistakes. Because to be honest, yeah. like if I make a mistake, on paper, like I deviate from a solver, it's really only a mistake if my opponents take advantage of it. If yeah. they actually don't, well, can we call it a mistake? It's definitely not optimal, but it doesn't mean that it's costing me money, right? 
I, yeah, I mean, like GTO can be a mistake. Like whatever, like makes you lose money is a mistake. Like if you if you decide like your opponent will fold way too often, then you make a bluff that is theoretically wrong because it was like the completely wrong blockers. But your opponent is folding way too often, then it would definitely be a mistake to follow GTO and not make that bluff. So mm. like, I feel like that's a bit, little bit of the like winning ugly uh way in poker like you can you can deviate a lot from gto and still uh still be much better than than your opponent who is like seemingly closer to gto but in some spots he's just really off mm -hmm. and to be fair it's just really difficult to be uh to be to never be off i think that is like a big reason why some people who are less focused on gto are performing much better than than like in the eyes of some people they should be performing mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point um so yeah speaking of that recognizing your opponent's mistakes and as it does set the very best from all the rest sort of set, sets these two groups apart um what are the things that you pay attention to? If you can share some tips for people of how to get better at recognizing what your opponents do bad and how to exploit it. Like what are the things that you pay attention to in game and perhaps away from the tables as well? Um, I think mostly I'm looking at the decisions of my opponents that I feel I uh, I would have made differently than they would. Uh, and like, ideally I force myself to think, okay, why, why did he make this decision? Like, um, like it could be that he just doesn't know how he should play the hand. Um, but let's say like someone made a river call that's like, in theory it's, it's wrong. Like he called away to weak hand or like bad blockers. Uh, but like overall, he's kind of like he's he's folding a lot in these spots. Then it's kind of likely he had a specific reason to do that, and, and it was not like uh, like he probably knew he should fold, but he mm -hmm. called anyways. So that kind of indicates that he thought I would be bluffing too often in this in this spot, for example. And then I would also think about okay, like why is that? Is there like a pattern? Is there a pattern where he thinks? Uh, I'm bluffing too often, and is that true? That is obviously like the next question. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, like I don't know stuff like how often are they trapping on the flop compared to how often they should be trapping on the flop, uh, and I look at like what kind of specific combos they use for it, and like it's kind of uh, like sometimes like people, let's say someone checks back on the flop and he raises on the turn when, when I bet out of position, um, like depending on which combos he chooses to check back, uh, for uh, like strong hands, he chooses to check back on, on the flop. Sometimes he will end up having way too many strong hands on the turn with his raising range mm -hmm. or like not having strong hands. Like for example, uh, I don't know, like if he, mostly checks back hands that are uh, um, getting much worse on a specific turn and then he raises, then it's kind of likely he has too many bluffs because uh, like his traps from the flop won't raise the turn anymore. Uh, stuff like that. Um, mm. I, I also think that what you were saying about like at mid-stakes, your opponents will likely care less about your mistakes. Uh, that is definitely true. And I think the main reason is at mid stakes, you're used to playing against weaker opponents and you're just trying to exploit them and you're not thinking about your own game too much. Mm -hmm. At higher stakes, that becomes different than like uh, people become way more aware uh, of like their own leaks and they also try to find leaks in their like opponents leaks uh, opponent games and not just focus as much on the recreational players like mm. in in 2010 for example when i was playing no limit uh ring games uh people were 
just looking at a recreational player and they were just trying to play as many hands as possible with him and exploiting him as much as possible. Uh, and they pretty much didn't care when, when being in a hand with another pro. Like they were super greedy, for example, just always betting much bigger uh, with their strong hands uh, because they were just so focused in their mind on, on, the, on the recreational player. They, they didn't put much effort into playing well against uh, good opponents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and which obviously is something you can't get away nowadays with. And then obviously, the, yeah. the six max game composition is also very different. You're unlikely to be sitting at the table with three or four recreational players at any yeah, stakes yeah. nowadays, I would assume. Um, and also, you know, just thinking about what you were saying um, just now made me think about another miscon- misconception that people have uh, from their work with solvers. Because you, you've mentioned about, or you mentioned how you pay attention to how people play. Um, let's say how much they trap on the flop and what does it do to their turn range, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? And you previously said that you're better off learning um, a simpler game tree from from the solver, as because obviously it's it's much much easier to execute, much easier to understand those concepts. But I believe yeah. that. A lot of people fall into a trap of just playing their game, the one they learned from a solver, without actually analyzing how is my opponent playing differently. Because you're not playing against the solver yeah. almost ever, because nobody really plays close. Even at, at your stakes, even at the, you know, the very, very top, people are still not so close as yeah. some some people might want to believe. So since you're not playing against the solver, you always have to evaluate what does it mean? How should I deviate? And if you're not capable of making the right adjustment in-game, uh, yeah. that also basically costs you, well, at least costs you EV. That's for sure. Yeah. I think like uh, it's it's basically what you said, like some people are just uh, like, solvers are often used as like a lazy excuse to uh, not think too much about the opponent's game. Uh, Like as long as your opponent is not playing perfect or close to perfect, probably there's more money in playing very good exploitive style against that than like trying to find the exact correct bet sizing or like the exactly correct mix uh, for your hands. and yeah, I think what most people ignore in that uh, consideration is that they are not playing as GTO as they uh, would like to um, themselves. Like, as I mentioned before, they when you play like five bet sizes on each, in each spot at the river, your range will be very different from how uh, GTO will uh, play at the river. And also like just a simple different thing let's say you are studying just the one bet size and you're comfortable playing against that one bet size but all of a sudden your opponent plays with a different bet size and you still yeah. apply the same template the same range without actually knowing or understanding how you should deviate from your baseline strategy yeah yeah i mean uh that's one thing i noticed a lot about uh like nowadays high stakes no limit games people tend to bet a lot with very small sizings on the river mm-hmm. and i think if you just if you're just not used playing against these, these small sizes on the river you will make a lot of mistakes for example not raising nearly thin enough uh against these races because then it's working really well for your opponent to bet uh very small with with marginal value ends uh, but also you will be playing uh, incorrectly on the turn. So, yeah, I mean, that is obviously one reason why you why you should look at complex trees. So, like, there are up and downsides for looking at very complex trees for sure. Uh, but I would say uh, what you kind of indicated was, like, there are a lot of upsides for using your brain, even if you're working a lot with a solver. Like, you mm. still need to use your brain and... Uh, like just working with the solver and not spending any brain capacities outside of that on poker uh, is not going to work very, very well. Yeah. Well, at least not going to work very well when you are actually shooting for the top. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know that people asked you in the AMA thread about your opinion of what's the future like for poker. Um, so what's what's the future like in poker? What, what do you think? I think it's it's really really hard to predict because like uh, what happened now in Germany with the regulations could also happen in a bigger poker market than Germany. Uh, so that would change things up a lot. Also, like a few years fr- uh, ago, GG poker was basically kind of irrelevant in, in the po- online poker landscape. Now it looks like it's uh, like already the most relevant site for high stakes or one of the most relevant sites for high stakes. Uh, I think it's really, really hard to predict. Uh, I just feel like for mixed games, uh, in specific, uh, it's very hard to imagine any uh, future real high stakes games anymore because it's just been a, a very bad development from 2014 or 2015 until now. And it's just getting worse and worse just because there are less people around. Like the player pool is very, very small and there are new, no new players. Mm. And I feel like, I mean, it's kind of the nature of poker that it's like, it can't last forever because at some point, uh, the people who lost, who are losing at poker lost so much that they don't want to keep playing anymore. And um, yeah, but I mean, whether or not like you can play a lot of like, let's say 5K NL or 5K PLO, uh, whether that will still be possible in, one, five, or 10 years from now, I think it's really hard to predict. And if you look at live games, for example, uh, I feel like live mixed games, for example, in the last few years look kind of good uh, in, in Vegas in the summer, for example. Uh, so like that bad development of mixed games is kind of specific just to online poker, not, not necessarily also to live poker. Mm. Yeah, and obviously, as you said, it's so hard to predict and uh, it goes in cycles. Like sometimes online um, has the best action sometimes. uh, Although, I mean, arguably the best action always used to be and still is live because, you know, it's just different types of games, different lineups. And uh, for a recreational player to play specifically against you, they need to view it as a challenge. Yeah. That's unlikely to be like uh, a nice Saturday night out with friends. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> although you could say for Isildur it was like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like he was kind of enjoying that, but for most people it, it is not like, uh, it is not nearly as enjoyable to play online high stakes uh, as live games. And also I feel like the environment for uh, an online poker is not very attractive for a recreational player or even like just a very successful life pro because like you hear so you hear so many stories in online poker about uh life solutions uh all kind of like fancy assistance that people have and i mean most of it is just like bullshit and not close to true like i mean there are for sure people using life solutions but that doesn't mean like 99% or even more, obviously, don't use live solutions. And uh, yeah, like in the last 12 months or so, I was so often accused by some people in, in some way that I was using like live solutions for sure, or like I was like the solver guy. And I feel like, uh, yeah, Th- that's just plainly wrong. But uh, if, you're a, if you're a live rec or a recreational player, you want to play against a human player where you feel like you have a real chance and you're playing mm. uh, a fair game. And yeah, I don't feel like, uh, partly it's the fault of the community, partly it's the fault of the high stakes players. Uh, like, I mean, it's kind of dumb if you play someone and he makes a play that is far from GTO and you laugh at him and say like, yeah, did you check like Pyro Solver? It's completely wrong what you did there. Mm. Like. Like people won't like to hear that, and like there's no reason for you to do that. You just like if you feel your opponent is playing bad, you should just be happy about it, but you shouldn't like mention it somewhere. Uh, 
yeah, I feel like that's pretty like it's it's pretty bad ethics and it's also pretty dumb for your own uh, career or business. Mm. Did you take that uh, those accusations that uh, you're using live assistance as a bit of a compliment for your hard work in a way? Um, yeah, I mean, in some way I did, but it also like people making these accusations were playing me at kind of low stakes and I was playing at the same time against very sweet at much higher stakes and that game didn't go too well. So uh, like, like it mattered to me much, much more how the game against Barry was going and how, how like that game felt to me than what like people at lower stakes were saying. Uh, mm. um, and what's your opinion? Because uh, we obviously had some um, highly public stories of live assistance in No Limit Hold'em recently. Yeah. Um, there is a precedent. So basically people, some people have live assistance and it's scary. Just how scary is it really? Should we all be afraid? Because if, if this is a trend, then we're clearly in the beginning and it might get worse. Is it something that is a big uh, problem for online poker in your opinion? I mean, like, I don't know, I don't know enough about these incidents, but I think it is a huge problem that the technology is there to use live solutions, uh, because as long as there's a technology for it, people will probably always find a way, uh, a, fa a way to implement them and use them. And as long as it's just like one or two people, that might mean that a few games might not be profitable anymore for any other uh, regular. But uh, I mean, that is bad enough, but um, over time, more and more people will, will get access to the technology and will start to use it. Mm -hmm. So that is really, really bad, I feel like. Uh, but I think there are also like ways, ways for poker sites and poker players around that because like, for example, certain formats of poker, uh, for them, it's much, much harder to make solutions and live solutions anyways. Like, if someone had a live solution for stud games, for example, I would be extremely surprised. I don't feel like there's any way someone has that or anything close to it. Or for example, in PLO or No Limit, you can just play around with the anti and change like the blind anti structure and uh, make life much more difficult for, uh, for um for people who want to use life assistance. But I mean, obviously at some point, uh, like it will be much easier to use life solutions because it's easier to, or like cheaper to, to calculate all the things. Um, and yeah, I mean, that is kind of the beginning of the end of high stakes poker, I feel like, because like who would, who would play uh, high stakes chess, for example, in an environment where you have no idea if your opponent is using uh, a chess engine. Mm. Like, it is a matter of trust. Like, you trust your opponent not to use it. But if you have no way to check it and you see people use it, you will lose any trust and, uh, like, you can't play these games anymore. I think it yeah. kind of happened to Limit Hold'em already. Like, like let's say... Uh, someone like an unknown player would start playing at 1k 2k uh limit hold'em and uh he would just be at the like the at the level of the other top players like he would not actually use a life solution but everyone would think he has a life solution because he came out of nowhere he's uh he's playing very good and it's always like like I, I read some about it in the uh, in the high stakes thread on two plus two when it was about whether Linus was using a uh, live solution or not. Like some other high stakes player were accusing him. Like <laughs> they are just quoting uh, spots where he actually did the same thing or like uh, something like what the solution is doing at a high probability, and they're saying, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a proof he's using his live solution, and um, like they're kind of ignoring the cases where he deviated from GTO. Uh, and it's always easy to, to think someone is using a live solution. Um, so 
like what I would say is just the presence of life solutions is much more threatening than like how often they're currently implemented because it's just creating a very bad environment uh, to play high stakes poker. Mm -hmm. And it definitely creates a very bad environment for people who want to, for the recreational players who want to go and battle against the the best because all of a sudden there's this extra risk that you're not only battling against the best, you're actually battling against the computer. And uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And obviously, there are not so many precedents, at least right now. Technology is there, it's all risky. But why do you think? Because the ways for cheating in poker existed since poker exists. Right, I, I had a conversation, a very long conversation with uh, David Sklansky about it, and he was telling about the games in Vegas in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, where so much yeah. cheating was going on, card sharing and whatnot, and uh, crooked games with uh, mark cards, uh, dealers in on it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the incentives for the high stakes poker are always there because obviously, you know, monetary uh, amounts that can be won with um, breaking the ethics and just basically breaking the rules uh, the incentives are high why do you think there are not there are not as many cases as, as there could be what stops people from or what makes people do you think it's actually what's your opinion is it that there's a deterrent that stops people from breaking the rules or is it um that people at the high stakes just want to be professional and fair and um, have high integrity. What's, what's your opinion? I guess hard to say. I, I mean, generally my experience is that if the incentives for cheating are high enough, people will just cheat. Uh, <laughs> and it's kind of hard to say like that's not applying for poker or online poker, but for everything else. But I think it's true that, like, uh, for a lot of uh, high stakes online or like high stakes online poker players, they have a higher ethical standard than most people that I know. Um, like, for example, I've been staking a lot of people over the years, and with staking specifically, I was never uh, cheated in any way. And also, like, when negotiating, for example, markup or uh, yeah, like the the conditions of the deal, I always felt like, or like nearly always felt like people were trying to make a fair deal. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's not its not like poker players are like great human beings. It's more like high stakes poker players usually are already at a very uh, good point, like in their life financially. So they don't feel the strong desire to, to cheat um, for more money. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, there are still cases, and from what I heard, especially in live poker, people uh, are cheating a lot. I think it's also like cheating is kind of frowned upon in in online poker, uh, whereas like in in live poker, some stuff is like uh, just considered like smart behavior or like angle shooting, and then there's like a the the line is kind of thin between uh, like what is allowed but not fair and what is cheating. Mm. And people will just keep crossing that line. Whereas in online poker, they are like, like when you're, when you're mentioning like collusion, like uh, if I, if I'm on Skype or some other voice um, messenger with a friend and collude in a six mix game and tell him what hands I have, we both know that it's cheating. And that, I think that is kind of preventing us from cheating. Uh, whereas like, for example, stealing buttons, for example, in some cases people thought, okay, other people are stealing buttons, so I have to do it myself as a like defensive mechanism. And then after a while, uh, you do it all the time because you got used to do it and you rationalize it like, yeah, I was cheated in the past too. Uh, I feel like that is happening way more in, in live poker than in online poker. And mm-hmm. also, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but I think most online poker players are somewhat lazy in a way. 
and it's not that easy to implement a live solution, uh, I guess. I don't know. Um, and it comes at a risk because, at least on stars, if you lose your stars account, it's it's really really bad mm -hmm. uh, for you. Um, but yeah, I I I would say that when it becomes easier to implement these live solutions and use them, it will also be come more frequent uh, and people will do it because it eventually like the stakes at poker are incredibly high and uh, like if you can cheat some people will do it mm. and speaking of stars actually because like you said losing your stars account is a uh is a huge thing and it is a deterrent especially for people who've been around and in general like just imagine the damage to the reputation if if you are at the high level already obviously you're not doing it solely for the money because financially you're probably set so you do it for other reasons and uh, your identity probably uh, is as a high stakes crusher and uh, so to to go and cross the line that sort of is uh, is going yeah. against what you stand for and, and against how, how you see yourself. But maybe that's just romanticizing. Uh, you know, maybe I feel that way and, you know, a lot of people that I know feel that way, but maybe somebody is just going to laugh at it and, and say, yeah, right, it's, it's not at all. True, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure there are high-stakes players who are basically just in for the money. And if they, like... If they are told, okay, use the software, make a million extra next year, they're going to do it. Right. But what do you think about this? Like, for example, poker stars, we all know, or I assume we all know that they do a great job, or at least better job than most other sites at uh, policing the games and trying yeah. to prevent any sort of, any form of cheating. Um, Yet a lot of high stakes games are happening at not even sites, just apps and whatnot, you know, where like why do people go for it? Because obviously the appeal is there's always the beautiful story of like, hey, come play our games. There's the massive fish who you've never met, and you can't verify if they're actually massive fish or there's somebody behind that screen, some some little wizard, uh, or worse yet, like uh, four other people just sitting in the same room and uh, you're the actual fish. Uh, why do people play these games without putting too, uh, too much effort into verifying what's actually going on? Because I've seen, and I've done it myself, it's just basically, oh, it's a great spot, so let's just jump in and then we think about it later. Is it just the sort of greed, fear of missing out? Like, oh my God, there's a great game. I have to play. I can't miss out on that. Yeah, I think that it's the greed, uh, fear of missing out thing. Um, because like, as we talked in the very beginning about it, like poker players are uh, always thinking about the AV pretty much. So if they, like, if you're used to playing somewhat tough games on stars or like let's say party poker and then you're invited to a game on, uh, to a game on an app where like a massive recreational player is playing and you're playing for super big stakes it's very hard to say no like uh also like it's really hard to evaluate like what the risks actually are because um i mean there are always certain ways of cheating going on, like people colluding with each other or even people like seeing your cards. And yes, it's more likely that on a new app, people are able to see your cards than on PokerStars because PokerStars is like regulated. They have a long track record pretty much. Um, but I mean, it's very hard to put probabilities on that. So mm. I think at the end of the day, you just have a gut feeling, okay, I should not do this, or I sh like, fuck it, I should do it. Um, and I think most poker players are very greedy when it comes to opportunities where they can make a lot more EV than they are used to. Uh, so yeah, um, I think that's the main reason. Uh, yeah. Mm. All right. Listen, I want to talk a bit about you quitting in the light of 
13 years playing professionally, achieved a lot, reached the top. How do you feel about it? When did you make the decision, first of all? When did you decide, okay, it's enough? Uh, was it a long time coming? Was it more of a um, impulsive decision? Well, I assume knowing you, it's most likely not an impulsive decision at all. But like, uh, can you talk a bit about um, making this decision? Because it is a huge decision. I mean, stepping away from something that you spent 13 years of your life, plus the way you spent it, not just playing but also like proper studies, uh, really diving deep into it, putting a lot of time and effort yeah. in it. Um, I mean, like throughout my career, like in the last few years, I thought a couple of times about quitting poker, actually. Like the first time I somewhat considered quitting poker was in 2013 or 2000, no, actually 2014. Uh, when like I felt like my no limit holding games were kind of dying back then, mm -hmm. like there were certain people who were obviously willing to play me, like maybe ten people or so, but I was not willing to play them because I figured they were better than me. But pretty much everyone else was not wanting to play me, so it was kind of the same situation as it is now, more or less. But then uh, I learned about the draw games. Um, uh, like got access to a solution for draw games and uh when you get like when you see 2k 4k games are running on a daily basis and you get a solution and uh you likely are one of the very few people who have a solution in that game like, yeah, i was super hyped about it and uh started studying and playing like crazy like crazy and i mean yeah some game ever appeared at some point like after when draw games were declining i thought like about maybe quitting again and then mixed games came up uh but it was never like a real plan to quit poker because i was always enjoying to play poker and it was not like uh like the the fun was gone was just like the action was kind of gone mm -hmm. um but for the fa past few years basically since isidore quit uh I've had kind of no action for a long period. Like uh, the only player I was playing against was basically um, very sweet. Sometimes mm -hmm. I was playing against uh, Shao Ren, Michael Turitz, but like 90% of my hands or more were against very sweet. And for there were periods when very sweet didn't want to play or where I didn't want to play very sweet. Uh, and it was super, super boring because there was just no game ever appearing or maybe one opponent came uh, during a day and he just was in for playing 10 hands and trying to hit and run. And I didn't feel like that was fun at all to me. Uh, so the first time I thought very seriously about quitting poker was uh, at the end of last year. Uh, and I thought like, if I can't beat Barry or if I don't want to keep playing against Barry Sweet at some point, probably it would be better to quit poker. And I mean, we didn't play this that many hands this year. And like, it, I wouldn't say it's impossible that I'm actually beating him, but it's very, very likely that, that I'm uh, not good enough to beat Barry uh, at the mix we were playing. So, and I don't, I, I don't feel like studying more would change that because i already feel like i've studied so much and uh probably also much more than he did uh so basically the alternatives for me are to play the very low infrequent games or playing much 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 lower or uh quitting and yeah i see i think it just seems logical for me to to quit at this point because uh the alternative is just not attractive enough. So it's not like, uh, I mean, it's it's probably not the best way to quit your poker career because as I mentioned earlier, if there was a great game for me, I would just keep playing it. I still like playing poker, uh, but the poker games that I like to play are just not there anymore. And what about playing live? That doesn't really appeal to you, right? 
I mean, one thing is like uh, now with COVID, uh, like it will take a, quite a long time until it will be possible to play again. Also, uh, I don't really want to play uh, No Limit or PLO live games. Uh, if I wanted to play live games, it would be the big mixed games in Vegas each summer and each winter. But I mean, I, I can't rule that out entirely, but uh, one thing is I always preferred online poker to live poker by a lot. Um, another thing is I feel like I would need some practice for live games. So I would have to start playing some at lower games. And then when I'm more comfortable playing live, I could start playing the big games. Uh, and that would take some time and I feel like it's not necessary for me anymore. Like it's not worth the effort. Like I don't want to become a good live poker player. I want, just want to play poker. Uh, so I think there's too much effort uh, connected with playing live poker for me. Mm. All right. Because if you are going to put in a lot of effort, you might as well do do something else. And I, I yeah. do want to find out about what's in store for you and if you know. But before we go there, let's... Because we were just on the subject of Barry. Um, and you've mentioned that you do think that you already studied more than him and still he is quite likely beating you in these games. Yeah. How, how do you explain it? How, how do you think about it? Like, what is the difference? Why is he so good? Is he so good? Like, what, what, what's going on here? Um, I mean... <laughs> The main thing I should say about it, I don't know, because if I knew, I would probably uh, have quit earlier or studied in a different way or in, a, uh, yeah, like, but what I think is like, uh, he comes from PLO uh, and he was, or is still is one of the best PLO players. And what I always feel like is no limits uh, and PLO are played at a much higher level than all the other games. Mm -hmm because the learning material for these games is much, much better, like the solvers. Uh, and um, like the two most popular games in poker. So it's just more competitive in general. And you can like, as we discussed earlier, you can apply concepts from these games to other games. So it's not like he's a new player to mix games. Like when he starts playing a new poker game, he already has a lot of ideas in his head that he can apply to these games. Uh, I think that is one reason why he's probably better at these games than not, like most people would expect him to be after playing so little of mixed game. Uh, I also think like, um, like you can study as much as you want and uh, play as much as you want. Like there's some kind of like raw poker skill, like uh, like skills that you cannot really learn. Like um, having a great intuition about um, how your opponent deviates from GTO and how you can exploit him, or like spotting timing tells in your opponent game, stuff like that. Uh, I mean, obviously it is connected. Like the more you play the more likely you will be good at these skills. Uh, but ultimately, like there's, I think there's just like some people are really good at it and some people are not as good at it. I would say I'm pretty good at it. Otherwise I wouldn't have made it to, to like no splits. Uh, but I would definitely say that Barry is better than, than me at these skills. Uh, like he's probably just like the better overall poker player. Uh, I would say like, um, like there were were a lot of bad signs in in my match against him. Like um, like like let's say for example in a situation where he would normally uh, hero call a lot and very rarely fold, and I felt like for myself, okay, in this specific situation, it will be really hard for me uh, to make enough plus. That's just like happening in some in some spots, and he would like often fold uh, in these situations, which is contrary to his normal game, or like uh, think for a very long time before calling and then showing a hand that is like a super clear call in GTO. Like that is a bad sign because apparently he's just exploiting me mm -hmm. uh, very lightly. And that was happening a lot. Um, yeah. 
And I feel like probably these things outweigh like the fundamental leaks that he has. Like he definitely has them. I, I guess he doesn't mind me saying that because we're probably like if it does anything, it will give him more action and he would want that. But uh yeah. Um like I was probably focused a little bit too much on like his fundamental leaks and not thinking too critically about uh how he's approaching the game. Um mm. But like eventually, I just don't know. Uh, I'm like, if I had to guess before this year, I would have said it's very clear that I should be a favorite in the match. Uh, last year, I was less confident about it. Um, but yeah, uh, it's not certain he was a favorite this year. But there were too many things happening that just didn't feel good to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And it must feel pretty discouraging when you see these things happen over and over again when when clearly he's exploiting you and, and you feel like i yeah. believe my game is quite solid and yet he finds ways to exploit me that's that's scary yeah i mean you get quite paranoid like you get paranoid about maybe i gave a timing tell here or uh maybe um yeah you think about all kind of bad things or like uh possibilities that explain what happens mm -hmm. i mean like, like win rate wise, he was not like completely crushing me, but he was clearly beating me. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there were also like, obviously, like it was not like he was always perfectly exploiting me. Sometimes he also made like a, a river call, for example, that was like super bad and I did have a good hand. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah. But overall, I just feel like, uh, also, aside from the results, he's very likely better than me. And um, combining it with the results, it's overwhelmingly uh, likely he's better than me. And what I would say for sure is like, if you look at just like the raw poker skills, like who's the better poker player, he's like close to 100% being better than me. Like if there's a new poker game, for example, you both learn it and after 20 hours of learning and we would play it against each other, you would probably be a huge favorite, I would say. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting thought experiment. It's definitely a, a good way of looking at the raw skill from, from this perspective. Um, a lot of people always talk about top three, top five, top ten, whatever. But we are playing a game which is unlike chess unlike boxing where you have clear winners and some clear metrics to decide yeah. who are the best first of all what is your opinion on these top five top top three things as as a thing like can we actually put people in brackets and if so is it how do we measure it how do we measure who are the top players in the world i mean like um I think it's not perfectly transitive. So like it could be, for example, that Barry Sweet is uh, beating me, I'm beating True Teller, and True Teller is be beating Barry Sweet. That would be possible theoretically, and that would kind of like make it like, then it would be nonsense to, to put up like a top three or top five uh, ranking if that was true. But I think mostly it's transitive. So I think if, one player is better than another, then this player will also better be than like if player A is beating player B, then probably player A is beating player C with a higher win rate than player B is, uh, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but because like all of what we discussed, like all the kind of exploiting uh, going on as people are not playing GTO yet, uh, I think it doesn't make too much sense to to put up uh, these rankings because someone might be much worse fundamentally speaking and losing against another uh, pro player, but might be much better at recognizing how recreational players are making mistakes and ex exploiting that. Uh, so I think that doesn't make too much sense. But um, for example, in mixed games, like there's such a small uh, there's such a small player pool. But it's kind of easy to say like who is in the top five uh, because if you go much below the top five, you are already looking at players who are mainly playing another game and just very bad at mixed games. Uh, 
And I think like if you say if you talk about PLO, uh, like sauce and very sweet being in the top ten is kind of clear, like regardless of what metric you use. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think people put too much emphasis on on these rankings because uh, like also like if you just like let's say some player had access to an app where he makes millions a year, but it's just playing against recreational players and he's playing super exploitive. Uh, like this player would not be in the competition for top three ranking because he's never battling against strong players, mm -hmm. but he's making a lot more money. And uh, like, he might also have more fun than these players. So like, what kind of reasoning is there to put them below these people in the ranking? Uh, and yeah, I mean, if you want to measure it like in a strict GTO way, I would say uh, people would have to play against a uh, solver and you would measure who's losing less against the solver. Then you would know who's closer to playing GTO. But I'm pretty sure that like the person who is playing closest to GTO is not like necessarily the, the better player uh, in real games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I can totally see why. Because like to get to such a good level in GTO takes so much time and effort in actually studying, memorizing, and um, yeah. kind of well, not strictly memorizing because pure memorization is is obviously impossible in a game like PLO or Hold'em. You're 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 fooling yourself if you think you can uh, memorize the whole game tree. But you're trying to memorize the way the solver thinks without ever critically thinking about how do we deviate against real people and how do we adjust yeah. the real strategies, which yeah. is such a critical part of, of being successful in poker, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I totally I'm totally with you on it. And I completely agree with you about all the metrics being there's no clear metric which would make sense because like if we measure money alone. Right, you've mentioned maybe somebody who has access to a private uh, app game or something, or maybe it it would be some of the well-known Hollywood actors who are actually making the most money yeah. and the most uh, having the most fun in the process, right? So may, maybe those guys actually are the best ever. Yeah. Right? Whereas obviously put them up against uh, a mistakes player from from online, and surely doesn't seem like uh, they have a chance. But right, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, and you've mentioned source many times. Um, actually, I don't want to ask you questions specifically about source. I'm, I'm more curious about what do you admire in other players? Like what characteristics, what uh, qualities do you look up to and, uh, well, kind of, yeah, admire? Um... I feel like if someone seems very like tilt resistant and uh, yeah, I think that is, that is a quality that I would really like to have because um, I mean, I feel like I spent very little time tilting on the tables, but uh, I often came to the point where I felt like, okay, I, ca I lost too much today. I just don't enjoy playing anymore for today. I will quit for the day. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that seems much easier to endure. Like uh, True Teller is coming to my mind. I don't know if it's still the case with him, but in the past, like he was sometimes losing like uh, like a lot of money or a lot of a lot of um, big blinds or big bets at on a day, and he seemed completely cool about it. Like uh, didn't seem like he was tilting tilting at all about it. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I mean. Obviously, like if I look at, for example, like uh, um, Linus against Barry, or Linus in specific, or in Linus in general, uh, in these no limit games, like he's using a lot of lines and fancy sizes that I just like. I'm kind of an outsider now in the no limit high stakes games uh, that I just don't understand, and I can still see like it was probably took an insane amount of effort to uh to get to that level uh studying the game mm -hmm. uh so that is really cool uh to see and uh i mean i started my career in no limit hold'em so uh it's kind of interesting to see how the game is now being played at a very high level or like let's say these people would theoretically be playing perfectly in in no limit it would be really interesting for me to to watch them play 
uh, I think that is also like a reason for many people to watch like uh, top chess players. Like they are not at the level where they actually understand what's going on, but they like to play chess. And then they see like the like top chess players play against each other and or like playing a top chess player play against uh, an engine. Uh, so I think it's always cool to see uh, like the best in an activity or like a game that you play yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I mean, there are other qualities. Like, for example, I did a lot of like staking with uh, Mikita Batsiakowski, Fish 2013. Mm-hmm. And like, he seemed always like super, like super happy, basically. Like he didn't, like it is, it is something different from not tilting. He was just uh, like, he seemed to enjoy playing like what he did. And I think mm-hmm. that's very important as well. Uh, yeah. Cause in the end of the day, I mean, poker is just part of your life. It's not your life. So yeah. if um, you know, you struggle with making a separation and if, your results from the day still weigh on you the rest of the day or a week or or more then it's just a pretty horrible place to be because swings are so common like you're gonna have swings all the time yeah Yeah. right um so what is in store for you in the future what are you looking forward to or right now you just uh, finally have like how does your day actually look like because for somebody who puts in so many hours into preparing for the games thinking about poker working on on the games like how is let's say your average day right now different to uh how it was when you were full-time playing um i mean i just have a lot more free time i would say uh, but I would not say that for now it's a good thing because we have a lockdown in Germany. And uh, I mean, I would like to do a lot of stuff. Like uh, I would like to go to London and Berlin and also probably Vienna and meet friends uh, and visit them. But that's just not possible. I would also like to do like, I mean, I'm already doing a lot of sports, but I'm, I like I can't go like uh, climbing anymore, for example, which I really like to do. Mm-hmm. And if like in a perfect world right now, I would just go every day basically, but it's just not possible. Same as for like meeting friends, like I, like it's much harder currently to meet friends. Uh, so yeah, uh, like COVID like had barely any influence on my life as long as I was playing poker because for playing poker, like it doesn't matter too much, but now it um, has a, pretty big negative impact um but yeah i mean i have a lot more time right now so i'm playing more uh like kind of like computer games or like recreational card games with friends online Mm -hmm. uh i'm just browsing more like random stuff or like watching stuff on twitch uh also i spent quite some time in the last one or two months on uh, crypto uh, and just like look kind of interesting to me, and like in specific one one kind one area in crypto where like I felt like I could make a lot of money, so I looked uh, a lot into it. Um, before that, I would have like during the game against Barry, I would just not have the time nor the energy to to do that. Um, but yeah, I have no I have no real like long term plans for what what's coming next, like on a professional level for me. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, you're in a in a nice situation where you can afford to just see where the stream sort of leads you and uh, discover new new things and, and see where you can apply yourself and your knowledge and your skills that which you gained through all these years battling poker at the high level and yeah. see where it leads you. And I would assume that... Uh, conventional career is definitely not the path you're going to go for working with, uh, you know, working in an office. I just yeah. don't see you there. I mean, I, I, I could see there are certain uh, circumstances where I would be willing to do that, but I would say like 99% of like conventional jobs in an office uh, would not be for me any, anymore because like I don't need the money in these jobs. I like learn to love the freedom in, in poker. Like you 
you can spend a lot of time on poker if you want, but if you don't want to spend time, you can just take a week off or a day off, uh, mm -hmm. and you just can't do that in a normal job. And uh, I would say, like, I would have liked to work more, like, um, close with other people, but uh, it's also pretty nice that in poker you can sort of be like the lone wolf and work work on your own and work when you want and the way you want. And an offer is like if you have issues with some colleagues, it's just going to be a horrible experience. Uh, and um, from what I hear from friends of mine who are working in these like so-called regular jobs, uh, like. Yeah, I think there are a lot of issues that you don't have in poker. And once you've appreciated these uh, things in poker, you don't want to go back. Or Yeah, yeah, it's obviously a beautiful space to be where you you don't have clients calling you with their problems, where you don't have employees, yeah. you know, doing their little tricks. So you don't basically have external problems set upon you. you you basically create your own problems if you want to and that's about yeah. it you just focus on what you do and also i feel like for people who really went for it at such a high level like yourself the work ethic is just so surprising there are not many careers where people work that hard there's obviously some careers you know especially if we think about some less healthy settings like Wall Street, for example, where people actually do work these crazy hours and uh, every yeah. minute sort of counts. Because what separates, let's say, your 12-hour 12, uh, 12 workday or 8-hour workday, it's actual 8 hours of work. There is no chit-chat with the colleagues. There is no coffee cup uh, you know, over a piece of cake or something like that. It's just you, yeah. you work 8 hours, you count 8 hours of work. You don't count the time you walk from... I don't know, the kitchen uh, to pick up your, your salad or whatever. Yeah. Speaking of huge investment of time, I'm actually curious about one thing. Um, obviously, since the tools came around, um, probably your improvement was um, more rapid. But let's say if we look back at the last year, where basically... You a year ago and you today, the only difference between these two guys is, is that you've put in extra huge amount of time into work. How much improvement do you think you gained over these crazy amounts of time? Because obviously over time, the better you get, unless something radical happens with the tools and new information, if information yeah. and tools stays the same, it's sort of diminishing returns. Yeah, in, in yeah. terms of how, how much you gain. But how would you evaluate it? Let's say this one year of, of um, very dedicated, very disciplined studies, how much of a difference it makes? Um, I mean, it kind of depends on the perspective. Like from a low, low stakes player perspective, I guess, uh, myself from a year ago and myself from now is probably the same quality of a player. But I would say, like looking at, at it at a more like detailed level, mm, I made quite a lot of progress. And I feel like the reason for that is uh, in mixed games, it works very differently from uh, from just playing No Limit or just PLO because in mixed games, you have to play five, six, or eight, or even more games. And there's just not the time for studying those games to a very, very high level. Like, uh, like even even if you look at the best few players in mixed games, each of them has a game or two where they're kind of bad at. Uh, mm -hmm. Like not just from a high stakes player perspective, but they are not very, they're just not very good at these games. Uh, like imagine like when you're a PLO player at high stakes, imagine you have to play eight games uh, of that quality. It's just impossible to have the time for it if you spend. Mm. Like if you spend four hours a day so far on your PLO, uh, and you would um, spend the equal, uh, like spend equal time on all these games, you would spend half an hour in the future or on each of these games. And if you say, like you mentioned earlier, like some high stakes players spending like one hour or thirty minutes uh, on their game each day, they would just spend like a few minutes 
on on each of these eight games. So, like, like you never have enough time in, in mixed games to to spend uh, as like to get uh, to get good enough at all games basically. Mm. Um, I felt like I improved a lot in one game specifically, Omar Ilo, for example, this year. Mm. I also improved quite a lot at uh, Res. And I mean, obviously, at some of the other games, I barely improved, like Used to Seven, for example. Like, it's very, very diminishing returns. If you already learned the game in 2014 and spent so many hands, like, spent so much time studying or playing against solutions and thinking about the game, uh, like, 10 hours more now barely make a difference. Mm -hmm. But that kind of means you should not spend these 10 hours and just spend 10 hours on your weakest games. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Because even when you're studying just the one game, you should always focus on your biggest weaknesses first because that's the the biggest returns in terms yeah. of the, the time spent. Yeah. Right. Um, are we going to see some cool graph from you? Something... Uh, Something like Kumikon style thing? Do you have something like that in mind? I mean, I cannot, I cannot compete with Kumikon at all. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna uh, like uh, I already mentioned that in my AMA. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna show my my graphs against Isildur, for example, and No Limit Holding, which back then felt really crazy uh, um, because like it was my first real no split game. Like I had a few 200, 400 games before. But it was always against like different opponents and against Isildur. Mm -hmm. I was for the first time playing regularly at these stakes against someone. So uh, yeah, and I mean, back then at least to me, this the the swings felt kind of insane. Mm. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. We're probably gonna put it in the video somewhere and uh, in the description. Sure. And also, I'm just curious about success and what do you? measure as success like when when was the time in your career when you figured okay i'm actually i actually achieved something i mean achieved something sounds too va vague but like when did you yeah. feel that okay i i achieved success in poker this was a career a good career choice and i'm happy i made it and i made it yeah. So I mean, the the first time I uh, I kind of felt like I could make it or make like a very good career out of poker was around the mark where I uh, had like 100k or so with poker because that was basically the time where I started playing uh, um, like NL1k, NL2k, something between that. And uh, at these stakes, you kind of have the vision to like, okay, I could also maybe make a million from this or 500K or whatever. Um, I guess the first time where I really felt like I've made it already was <laughs> like, it was kind of just a little bit later time-wise uh, when I was like close to uh, winning 1 million overall. Uh, I think in 2000. 2012, I think. Uh, yeah. Mm. Um, but I mean, I would not say that was like a big moment for me. Uh, it's more like a like a, a constant process of like rising through stakes and uh, yeah. Uh, like I, I wouldn't say like I felt uh, incredibly happy when I reached the one million mark. I probably didn't even like notice it in the session. It was more like couple of days later, I updated my bankroll sheet and I saw, okay, I before I had 950K, now I have 1.05 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because at what point does the money stop being a factor for you? Um, I think it was also some kind of gradual uh, process, but I feel like Probably somewhere like between the second and the third million or something. Uh, I felt like uh, like when I first thought about like uh, making a living out of poker or like um, never having like uh, 
the financial need to work again, I always was thinking about like 2 million or something. Like I figured that 2 million would probably be enough. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if that's like a reasonable way to think about it, but that's, that's how I thought about it back then. And uh, I guess some, somewhere between like the two or three, three million mark, I, uh, yeah, I will have that thought that uh, I've like financially succeeded at poker. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if I had quit after like winning half a million or one million, that would have been a massive success anyways, because uh, in a normal job, uh, it would have taken me like a decade or like three decades or whatever to, uh, to reach that mark. So, uh, mm. yeah. And also I guess you felt it, but you maybe also naturally are, um, predisposed that way. But I, I also think like whenever people get to, uh, bigger wealth quickly, their lifestyle doesn't catch up as quickly because like if we look at people who gradually increase their salary even if gradually yeah. means every six months they get a raise your life catches up you know you, you you were living on let's say 20k a year all of a sudden salary is 30k your expenses are 30k and then it just keeps going until you know you're actually spending a huge amount yeah. of money whereas if it happens more rapidly your life doesn't change as quickly as, as your financial situation. And once you already are comfortable with your new financial situation, you realize, you know what, I don't actually need all these toys and all the status symbols and, and all, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I would agree with that. I mean, it, it makes sense. And I think it was kind of like that for me. Like, uh, I mean, when you study or play poker all day, you don't feel the need to spend like a few hundred K a year normally. Uh, but I mean, if you look at sports, for example, when, when, uh, when like people get their first paycheck and make like a million in sports, they often like buy a super expensive car or a watch or whatever. Mm. Uh, or like when people win in the lottery, obviously, uh, they kind of spend a lot of money initially. Yeah. Um, but that's different though, because let's say in business, when you're creating, working on a business you're creating a product or something you put in so much work and sweat and you see the direct response of input to output right so yeah. you actually feel how much that money uh how you earned it right whereas if you're a yeah. ball player or or something that is just there's no direct link between what you do and uh what uh, yeah. what comes especially like obviously in a lottery is a completely extreme example right you actually like all you did was buy a lottery ticket so it's not yeah. you know it's not uh, that much time invested and uh, yeah uh, yeah i mean for me it's definitely true like when like i never had the like the i never feel the urge to to spend a lot of money because i was just like playing poker enjoying it a lot and uh trying to get as good as possible and during that time, you don't like, uh, like people sometimes ask, like, did you buy something nice for yourself, like to reward yourself kind of, but I mean, like playing at higher stakes and being successful there. And like, that was reward enough for me. Like, uh, it wouldn't make a difference if I buy a watch for hundred K or a 50 K, whatever amount. Uh, it's just like, you care about being as good as possible in the activity you do, or like in the, uh, in the in the business you participate in. Like um, a few days ago, for example, I talked to a friend of mine who is super successful in crypto, like like financially speaking, way more successful than, than I was in poker. And uh, like he, he like it, like we were talking about like absurd amounts of money that 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 he was uh, like that his business was circling around. And then like later on, we were talking about uh, football and he said like, okay, for like, for the Champions League final, I would be, I would be willing to pay like 30 euro as a maximum or like, like he was thinking between like, is it 20 euro? Is it 30 euro? Is it 40 euro? And like, it's kind of like, I felt it was kind of absurd because like, he has so much money. It doesn't even matter if he went, would spend like 1k on it or like, uh, 
500 euro. Like it should be pretty much the same amount. And like when he thinks about his business, whether like he spends 10 million and 500 euro or something or uh, 10 million and 500,000, doesn't make a difference. But then in his like day to day life, uh, apparently he cares still about 20 euro or 30 euro. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's basically what you said, like, it's just a completely different environment. And, uh, yeah, like for me, it was somewhat similar. Like it's like poker didn't really have any, uh, big influence on my spending, uh, on me spending money. Mm. Well, now you have the time to spend money. So we'll see. We'll talk with you in, in a few months time when you're on the yacht uh, somewhere Maybe. parked next to, <laughs> next to Perkins, both uh, trying to run it down to zero. Uh, that would be fun. And speaking of football, actually, do you want to give us a bit of history about your screen name? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny, like... Um, People associate me now with like Raul Gonzalez or San Ica, which I was on uh, Full Tilt Poker. But to me back then, uh, I was playing on like 10 different sites pretty much at the same time. Mm -hmm. was still in the era of a lot of Euro sites being present. And I kind of had to find a name for each site. Right. Uh, so I was a big Real Madrid fan at that time. And like the most natural thing to me felt like I would just name myself after all the players or like after all my favorite players. Uh, I barely put any, any thought on it. If I, I could, if I could travel back in time, I would just have, uh, I would have just chosen a name that would be more friendly or more attractive for like recreational players. But back then I was just, looking for a way to uh to find a screen name but like you you don't if you you don't want to you don't want to choose a completely random name on on poker stars or Fulted that you would regret uh a few years later uh but also like i was making an account pretty much every week or every month at a new site and you don't really want to spend time on it so uh yeah, I was I was just using like my favorite pl uh, football players as screen names, basically. Hmm. All right, awesome. Yeah, I. So the question I had, I um, wanted to ask you about uh, your parents, right? Because obviously, you know, starting in poker at a young age, everybody who's done it, they faced some sort of a conversation with their parents of what exactly are you planning to do with your life. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a bit about that. Like, how was, how did you, like, how did this happen, actually? How did they find out that, okay, our son is now uh, a professional poker player. Uh, they probably didn't even know it's a thing. Um, so how was it? Um, I mean, initially, like, I was still uh, studying part-time or even more than part-time because, like, uh, yeah, I was kind of st studying regularly on the side while playing the lower stakes of poker. So they didn't really care too much as long as, as I studied. Um, basically, I had that kind of conversation with my parents when I finished my uh, bachelor program. And I was basically considering to either start with the master program immediately or uh, wait one year because you could not like... You could only start in, in winter each year. You could not start in summer. So it would be no break or one year break. And mm -hmm. I was uh, thinking about it, but I was kind of, I had kind of made up my mind that I want to give it one year in poker, uh, like full time poker, and see where I can get. And uh, my parents were not happy about that at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I mean, they they didn't say I shouldn't do it. Uh, but it was kind of obvious, like they they were strongly trying to pursue me to not uh, to not take a break from studying and play poker because I think they also felt like if I take one year, it might not be just one year; it might be more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I mean, it was my decision, and I talked talk to them about it and they I guess they kind of knew I was somewhat reasonable and I had already some success with poker and uh, I also like um, 
they knew the parents of the guy who was coaching me back then and all them and told them and he was super successful with it so uh they had some idea that it was not completely crazy what i was doing uh and i gave it a year and um after that year i actually started studying in my master program but uh basically i never started studying at a reasonable pace again like i I did half of the master's study in, I don't know, three uh, in three years or so, while usually you finish the study in, uh, in two years. So I was in pace for six years studying. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, they were not happy about my decision to, uh, to start playing poker professionally, I would say. But they got more and more used to it. And um, yeah, uh, after my father died, actually, my mother told me that uh, he was not as cool about me playing poker as he always pretended. Okay. Because like, like it always felt to me like he was kind of cool about it. My mother wasn't. Uh, and like he had, he was, he kind of liked playing card games with friends as well. So I guess he could kind of relate to me playing a card game professionally. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, apparently that was not entirely <laughs> the case, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they were not super happy with it and not even happy considering how successful I got in poker. Uh, but, uh, they accepted it and that was good enough for me. Hmm. Was there a specific point at which they accepted it or... Was it just gradually? I think it was gradually of, growing. Uh, they got tired like, of basically <laughs> expressing their contempt with you when it became clear that, okay, this is he's not doing anything else. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of avoided like talking about like the daily swings with them because I feel mm -hmm. like if I, if I had done that, um, uh, probably they would not have like liked it at all and it would have led to some, some kind of conflict. But, uh, like, I, I do the same with my friends, basically. Like, uh, like it's kind of hard to tell someone, hey, I lost 500K against this opponent this week. Um, and they think, like, okay, that is, like, 10 or 20 the uh, times my yearly salary. Uh, um, that sounds like your life is completely out of control. And in reality, it's just, uh, like, let's say it's, 150 big bets or 200 big bets uh and it's like considering the crazy stakes it's a normal amount of money and next week you might be winning 500k uh so i kind of avoided talking to my parents or also my friends about like the craziness in specifics but they were knowing i was playing for a lot of money did you feel that your friends started treating you differently in any way or that didn't really happen no i think i don't think they started treating me differently in any way like uh like i would say i mostly have like a few friends but i know them for a long time already uh and uh it kind of didn't matter like obviously sometimes we talked about it or maybe like i was like when we met other people i was like announced as like the crazy poker player <laughs> uh but uh i mean obviously it becomes part of your identity if you're a poker player especially in germany where it's very very unusual to uh to be a professional poker player um but yeah i, I don't think it changed much between me and my friends mm. Oh, that's good. That's good. Good friends. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Folk, is there anything else you want to talk about today? No, not really. <laughs> I think I think we went, uh, we covered so many topics. I'm sure people are going to ask a lot more questions. I'm going to keep, keep an eye out on the comments. So you, sure. the listener, if you have questions, shoot them down there in the comments and uh, we'll do our best to answer. And who knows, maybe we do a round two one day uh, after three months of you enjoying freedom. <laughs> we'll see how, how that pans yeah. out. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank you so much for making the time to, to do this today. Um, and you know what? I always remember like we met the first time I don't remember how many years ago, but some years ago, the first time we met, 
and I remember distinctly like from this short interaction with you that we had I took so much away for myself of just seeing somebody with a completely different at that time a drastically different approach to what it means to be a professional and uh, how to work you know it was so inspiring to me I, I remember walking away from that meeting and thinking like wow, you know what, uh, why am I not doing the same, at least at some capacity, right? Because I'm still never reached the point where I studied six hours a day and I don't think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. But that meeting for me was definitely transformational. Like you're one of the, one of the few people who actually influenced the trajectory of my career in, in, in a big way, even though you probably yeah. like, because it wasn't, we didn't even talk strategy or anything. It was just a normal conversation. But just seeing somebody yeah. so dedicated, so professional, with such a great approach uh, to the game. So I hope that you know. That's at, very at nice least, to hear. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really hope that at least some of the listeners are going to feel the same way about this conversation with you here, and uh, they're going to take away things for them. Um, plus, we discover uh, discussed quite a few things which actually have just a practical application and uh, that's also that's also so nice that you're you're open about sharing your ideas and letting other people learn from your experiences yeah it was a pleasure being with you thanks for having me yeah awesome thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed this episode check out the description and of course i'd highly appreciate if you subscribe click like spread the word about the podcast Also, if you'd like to receive a regular newsletter with my key takeaways about each episode, go ahead and subscribe to it on runchexpodcast.com. That's R-U-N-C-H-U-K-S podcast.com. I write those myself. I take it seriously and I really enjoy the interaction with the readers. So I hope you'll sign up uh, and I'll be back for you next time. Thank you.